Colleagues, good afternoon. Thank you very much for coming. Nice to have you here. Greetings of the season. Happy holidays. Hope you all take a break over the holidays. Hope you all have a good time with your friends and your family and good health and um, great year in 2017. Um, we've had a busy year in 2016. The activity levels remain extremely high. Uh, there's a great deal going on. We're going to speak to a lot of it, so I won't take time uh, at the beginning uh, to rehearse any of that. Let us say there is just a great deal of work underway. Um, uh, I want to note that Bill Fish is not present uh, because he's out of the country, uh, and Janet um, Ecker uh, was with us uh, uh, for some commercial discussions, uh, but has had to step out uh, a step away now, and I'm not sure when she'll be uh, back. Um, uh, but otherwise, we're in full attendance here. Uh, we've received quite a lot of correspondence um, uh, over the last uh, while about, uh, principally about Davenport Diamond, um, uh, and, and a couple, uh, and a letter also on Stovall Corridor. Um, the Davenport Diamond matter is not on the agenda today. Um, Stovall Corridor is as part of RER, um, uh, um, uh, but we do, of course, take account of all the letters. They are shared with all the members of the board. Um, I have a list of them on Davenport Diamond. Corresponds from Judy Land, uh, Hema Vias, uh, Sharon <coughs> Thiessen, Aaron Pleat, Laura Zeglin, um, uh, Brent Cahan, uh, Matt Park, Sebastian DeGrandis, and Maria Costa. And all those are available to anybody who would like to see them. Um, and I say the Davenport Diamond work continues and we'll be back at the board at various times. It's not on the agenda. On the Stovall Corridor, we have correspondence from Lauren uh, Ross, uh, and we've also got a copy of Metrolinx's reply uh, to Mr. Ross. Um, with that, Bruce, I think we should go straight to you because we've got a lot to get through today, and I don't want to get behind. Bruce McQuaig, our distinguished leader. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Um, as I usually do, I'm just going to start with a bit of a highlight of the last quarter, and uh, it has been and continues to be a busy time. Uh, I was in Barrie on Monday with the Minister of Transportation and then on Tuesday again in the Downsview Park, a uh, new station that's under construction, to announce uh, new service that will start on December 31st on the Barrie Corridor. Uh, there will be a total of 19 new trips that uh, we will begin between uh, Aurora and Union Station uh, and it's the beginning of two-way all-day service given that we will be operating in both directions. And out of those 19 trips uh, per weekend day, six of them will extend up to the uh, to the Barry community, with three trains coming down in the uh, southbound in the mornings and three trains uh, returning in the late afternoon and evening. So it's a it's a significant increase in service. We currently have 70 weekday trains on the Barry corridor. So adding uh, another 38 trains to that corridor over the course of the of a week is a significant increase in the level of service and continues on with our march towards uh, higher and higher levels of service across uh, the entire system. We also opened on Monday the new Gormley GO station on the Richmond Hill corridor and uh, this extension, this new uh, station, it also involves an eight kilometer long extension of service on the Richmond Hill corridor and uh, it includes about 850 more parking lots in our inventory and uh, I know that this will be very well received as uh, uh, it provides just not more service for that community but also provides some relief to some of the congestion that we see on the Barry Corridor as well. Uh, I was at an event yesterday with the, the Premier and a variety of ministers and stakeholders to celebrate I think a really important and positive development with respect to the, the Eglinton Crosstown project and that's the, 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 the formal uh, signing of the declaration for the Community Benefits Agreement where uh, in partnership with Crosslinks Transit Solutions, the Ministry of, a of Advanced Learning and Skills Development, uh, community agencies like the Toronto Community Benefits Network in the United Way, uh, we're uh, declaring a target of 10% of all apprenticeships and uh, journeyman work on that project uh, being targeted from historically disadvantaged 
disadvantaged communities and equity seeking groups and uh, it is just an example of how we can leverage the major investments that we're moving ahead with on the program uh, to not just provide the transit and transportation benefits but also to provide broader social and economic benefits for the communities that we're serving. Um, on to my next point, I, uh, as of today we're down to the final seven subway stations I believe uh, where we are installing Presto at at least one entrance by the end of the calendar year. Uh, today Victoria Park became Presto <coughs> enabled and on Monday the Castle Frank subway station became Presto enabled. We've also extended our agreement with the, the gateway newsstands at subway stations to be points of distribution of uh, uh, the purchase for, of, of Presto cards, as well as to provide uh, a supply of cards that are targeted at the senior community so that they can get their senior concessions, not just at the Davisville subway station, but other locations as well. In the last uh, uh, month, we've also celebrated the 1,000th a bus that's been delivered through the Transit Procurement Initiative, which is a joint project uh, with a variety of different transit agencies around the province. And uh, to date, we've saved uh, the, the taxpayer in a variety of different communities, $16, $16 million. And it continues to be a very popular and a successful program with our uh, partners in the variety of municipalities that we're working with. We cel celebrated the opening of the segment of the Viva Rapid Way in Newmarket along Davis Bra uh, Drive in October uh, with the, the formal opening of that segment. Again, another example of uh, having outcomes and uh, successful delivery of the program. And uh, we've issued a variety of uh, requests for qualifications. So on October 18th, we issued the RFQ for the Here Ontario Light Rail Transit Project. Uh, and uh, uh, in terms of the Regional Express Rail program, we will be getting an update for the board today on 13 major construction contracts that are being advanced to provide the foundational uh, uh, services and the work required to expand service over the next five years. On September 14th, we issued the RFQs for a new tunnel under Highway 401 on the Kitchener Corridor. Uh, for a redevelopment of the Cooksville GO station and for the redevelopment of three of the GO stations along the Stouffville corridor. And on November 30th, we issued the request for qualifications for the Kipling terminal uh, where we integrate with the, the subway uh, as well. So a very major and important uh, project, not just for us, but for the TTC and the other transit agencies that serve the Kipling station. We're in the middle of market sounding for uh, the following contract work for Regional Express Rail that will include electrification, signalization, vehicle stations and uh, uh, other infrastructure uh, and uh, this will uh, lead to major decisions that will be coming back to the board over the course of the, the next 12 to 18 months in terms of how do we package uh, the various other initiatives that we need to move forward with on the RER program. Um, of course, I have to acknowledge the agreement in principle with the City of Toronto uh, on the inclusion of Smart Track on the uh, RER program and also that we've received support from the other municipalities for the new stations. So we've received resolutions of support from York Region, Vaughan, Innisfil, Breslau and Waterloo for the other new stations allowing the inclusion of all 12 stations into the procurement program for Regional Express Rail. And uh, we've uh, just completed a major region-wide consultation on a variety of topics related to RER, including the electrification of the system, uh, which has next steps in terms of uh, initiating the formal uh, transit project uh, assessment process in the new year, uh, and getting input on a variety of other topics and initiatives and projects around the region. And uh, we also just concluded on November 30th the uh, this stakeholder and public consultation on the discussion paper related to the regional transportation plan. So there's been a lot of conversation and engagement with the, the public, with the municipalities and with stake stakeholders as well. And finally for the board, I'd just like to, uh, as I always end up, I'd like to recognize a few things that have happened in the last few months. Uh, we did receive two awards for our uh, Go Transit customer etiquette campaign. Uh, from the Customer Marketing Association in the category of Business Products and Services. The campaign for customer etiquette on the GO service won the Bronze Award for, for both digital and communications in general. And uh, when you think of who uh, uh, beat us for the gold and the silver awards, the gold went to Google and the silver went to McDonald's, so we were in pretty good company in terms of the, the other uh, 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 recipients of awards uh, in this important uh, recognition of uh, the program that we have. 
Um, I know Rob Siddle is in the room. And I wanted to acknowledge that uh, Rob Siddle, our chief financial officer, was uh, recognized by his uh, industry association, the Chartered Professional Accountants Association, in the past weeks uh, and awarded a, a fellow. Um, and uh, this is a recognition of Robert's many contributions to the industry and specifically related to his work on the Public Sector Accounting Board. So congratulations, Robert, on that. Uh, I also saw Eve Wyatt earlier on. I'm not sure if he's, Eve is still in the room. No? Okay. Um, well, maybe I'll just you know, regardless say that uh, Eve, who many of the people in this room know, will be retiring. Uh, uh, at around the end of the year, after 31 years of service to okay. originally Go Trans, but also to Metrolinx. I've known Eve, I think I first encountered her in 1995, and she's been a, a real hallmark and a stalwart for uh, advancing transit and transportation in the region. And I think she's worked in virtually every part of the organization, planning, operations, communications. So we will miss her and thank her for her many contributions over the years. Uh, I also wanted to acknowledge that we have a, a new uh, senior leader in the organization, Martin Powell, who has joined us, uh, and uh, some may uh, recognize Martin from his time with the city of Mississauga, where he retired <coughs> as the commissioner of, of transportation and public works, and will be joining us to really focus on the fare integration piece. And Martin brings lots of experience and contacts and relationships in the municipal world that I think will come in great stead for us as an organization. So with that, Chair, I think that's the, the update I wanted to provide before we got into the agenda. Thank you very much for that, um, and thanks for all the work that you and your colleagues are doing and doing very, doing very well indeed. I think we should go right to the presentation rather than having discussion now. I think what you've got on the agenda of some important matters. Um, John Jensen, we're going to do Regional Express Rail in three chunks. The first chunk uh, led by John, the second and third led by Leslie. Um, and John, um, thank you. Please bring us up to date on where we are uh, with getting out the first package. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And I have with me uh, Michael Wolchuk. He's the Vice President of Corridor Infrastructure responsible for uh, the bulk of what we're uh, going to look at uh, today. So the purpose of this presentation is to provide the board with an overview of the progress being made on the procurement of regional express rail, state of good repair, expansion and optimization. At the, uh, you'll recall at the June 2016 meeting, uh, the board approved the regional express rail procurement plan. Uh, that procurement plan included uh, three work packages. Package one, uh, which is a series of contracts already underway or upcoming with the target completion of 2020. Um, this package includes contracts that are procured under the traditional design bid build as well as uh, larger design build finance and uh, build finance contracts and covers both off corridor and on corridor works. Uh, we refer to these contracts as enabling works because they're uh, necessary to prepare for upcoming larger procurements uh, down the road. Uh, those procurements are included in packages in two and packages two and three, uh, which are larger contracts procured through the alternate finance procure process, AFP, uh, along with Infrastructure Ontario. Um, the primary reason for going this route is to improve quality, cost and schedule certainty by assigning risk to the uh, party best able to manage it. The package uh, two procurements are expected to be awarded in 2019 um, and will include uh, off court or in infrastructure uh, such as stations, parking lots and parking garages. And the package three procurements also expected to be awarded in 2019 include on corridor works uh, as Bruce mentions, uh, signals, uh, electrification, track um, and vehicles. For the package one works, we just let me go ahead. interrupt you to ask two questions relevant to this. The first is when this was announced in 2014 as a 10 year program, we said that's 40 quarters and we got to get stuff done every quarter if we're going to deliver on the 40 quarter um, outlook. Are we, with the timing of these, is that staying on track against the 40 quarter 10 year uh, schedule? That's the first question. And the second question is, why do we wait until 2019 
to do two and three. If someone asked me tomorrow afternoon, why aren't you doing it mid-2017? Just give us the intuition why it has to be staggered a couple of years behind the first package. Okay, so in answer to your first question, Mr. Chair, yes, we're on track. Um, part of what helps us stay on track is by refining the procurement uh, strategy to uh, include the AFP delivery model. It allows us to take full advantage of the schedule, um, uh, schedule innovations that we get from the private sector. Uh, the reason that uh, packages in two and three are uh, further down the road, another two years down the road, um, is twofold. One is that uh, there are a number of enabling works that need to be completed in advance of that, including environmental assessments and other infrastructure programs that will then allow these bigger packages um, to, uh, to unfold as we go forward. And as we develop the larger packages, we have to do a few things. One is that we're continuing to do market soundings right now to make sure that we've structured the packages correctly to get the best industry engagement possible to bring the right players to the table. And then it takes some time for us to um, do, the, um, do the initial qualifications of the firms that we need to come to the table to make sure that we get the best, most qualified firms. And also we have to do the advance work in terms of uh, preliminary design and preparing the procurement documents for these big procurements because you can appreciate that it's a very complex process and we need to make sure we get it right. The timing is structured such that we can do the enabling works in the right order and then get to the bigger projects and then finish on schedule um, as per the announcement. So the 2019 is still consistent with 2024 that's right. completion of the whole thing? Yes, that's correct. And does that include the additions that have been made with the Toronto Agreement? Uh, that includes the additions made with the Toronto Agreement. Great. It would not include the more recent announcement of something like Bowmanville? The recent uh, new announcements we're currently working through and, uh, and uh, establishing the structure for those and determining the schedule for them, but uh, we're certainly uh, working to, uh, to deliver those projects as per the announced uh, dates. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Back to you. That's very clear answers. Thank you. Okay, so back to uh, package one. Um, as I said, we've been working collaboratively with Infrastructure Ontario on package one to develop 13 larger com uh, projects or, or contracts. Uh, these contracts uh, are at least in the $100 million range, uh, probably ranging in the $1 to $400 million range, and they're being procured as uh, either a design build finance or a build finance contract. And the total value of these 13 contracts is, is about $3.4 billion. And Bruce mentioned a couple of them, four of them are already in procurement. Uh, three Stouffville corridor stations and uh, Steeles Avenue grade separation, and I'll speak a little bit more to these. Highway, one, f Highway 401, 409 tunnel to accommodate two new Kitchener corridor tracks. Cooksville GO station parking structure and station improvements, and Kipling bus terminal and, and GO station in improvements. There are also a number of uh, smaller enabling contracts that are already under construction uh, or will be going into procurement over the next year. The Stouffville Station's package is currently in the RFP stage um, with three bidders that were successful in the recently completed RFQ process. And that contract includes design build of station modifications necessary to make Agent Court, Millican and Unionville stations ready for RER service. Uh, it also includes the Steeles Avenue grade separation which is immediately next to the Millican um, station. This is an example of uh, bundling or combining several linked projects to reduce cost and disruption and to, to make sure that we can move the program forward. And this station work includes a uh, plat uh, new platform for a new second track, tunnels uh, with stairs, elevators, weather protection at the platform level, and other improvements such as parking, passenger pickup and drop off, uh, pedestrian connections, and bike facilities. Another significant package one bundle is the on the Kitchener Corridor. Um, ultimately, the Kitchener Corridor uh, is going to have uh, requires four tracks, um, which means the existing tunnel under Highways 401 and 409, which you can see there in blue, um, is designed for two tracks, but currently has three tracks squeezed in with uh, clearance and speed restrictions. So we're going to improve that by uh, constructing a new tunnel, which you can see on the slide in yellow, um, immediately east of the existing tunnel. 
Uh, this is a particularly challenging project because the, um, the top of the tunnel is very close to uh, the actual highway itself. Um, so we need to make sure that we construct that uh, without interfering or dis disrupting with the highway. So it's a particularly challenging project. This is a design-build finance contract, which is currently in the qualification st stage, and then the successful bidders will move through to the RFP. We've been working with the City of Mississauga on uh, how the growth of the Cooksville, Cooksville GO station fits in with uh, area development, and the result uh, is a project to improve the station and construct 1,900 space uh, parking structure. Uh, the project was reviewed by a joint design review panel with the city, city of Mississauga, and it's also being coordinated with the uh, Hero, Here Ontario Light Rail System. As part of the future Here Ontario Light Rail work, an accessible weather-protected pedestrian connect, connection will also be provided uh, between the, the GO platform and the LRT station. The Cooksville station project is a design-build finance and is currently in the qualification stage. Currently, GO and My Way buses are unable to access Kip Kipling Station and connect with GO service. Um, My Way buses currently connect with the TTC subway at Islington, one station away. Uh, the Kipling GO Station and new bus terminal project will integrate TTC subway, GO regional rail, uh, GO bus, and My Way into a single mobility hub through a new interregional bus terminal and other supporting infrastructure. Uh, the main components of work include a new bus terminal, new pedestrian bridge connecting the GO platform, new pedestrian tunnel connecting this TTC subway, uh, GO station and platform upgrades, including uh, accessibility. The RFQ was uh, issued late November. And is that design ours or is that someone else's? It looks sort of space age, um, that tip of the front of the hat or whatever. Is that? Is it, that? Was, it was designed through us, yes. Design what? Through, through us. So this is through the Design Excellence Program and the yes, like? That's right, and through the Design Review Panel. Okay. Am I right that it's a different aesthetic than usual? Is that because of all the buses having to come underneath it or something? Yes, I'd say the, the renderings uh, don't, don't give it the, uh, the credit it deserves. But it's, uh, yes, Chair, it is to accommodate buses, and uh, there is quite a bit of canopy cover. As the stations progress, would we be taking a, um, a kind of um, uh, a more consistent approach to, might we uh, consider taking a more consistent approach to the multiple stations as a kind of strategy for not only branding but um, obtaining multiples of, of a station that actually speaks to what this, the new corridors would be? That's an approach I think we should consider Sir? rather than one off. I think the. Yes, and that's good. Really that really challenging with the with the number of stations going out on the timetable to actually produce one-offs, and and they don't have that consistent. This one I understand is part of a TTC subway station. So was it negotiated as part of an existing yes. station, or is it yes, an add-on? Or it's, a, it's an add-on to an existing station. It is a very unique type of facility. It's not a typical GO station uh, because it incorporates a, a, a terminal that's largely used by uh, My Way Mississauga buses. So I think this is such a big part of our kind of, of Metrolink's community engagement is that actually working through a prototype, you know, not beyond guidelines, but actually just a prototype for a station that becomes something that people understand. It's very legible. It's accessible. We work out all the kinks on a <coughs> singular idea of a station, not just a guidelines, but actually and then are able to roll that through is something I think that it would be great if uh, our building divisions, our capital projects and planning thought about. Certainly, and those are all uh, very valid comments. And uh, uh, the design of uh, of uh, this station, as as are all of our designs, um, are working through the design excellence process with the design review panels, and uh, we work very closely with planning to make sure that uh, uh, we're moving forward consistently with the uh, the design excellence expectations. And so it would reduce the risk uh, uh, and the work for the design review panel if there was a kind of consistent approach. And, I sort of likened it to European stations where they are, there's consistency or to the stations that CP or CN put across the country, you know, where they're very legible. I'm not suggesting that design, but something that fits our, who we are and where we are 
and uh, as we are in Eglinton and Crosstown. And as we are in Eglinton and Crosstown, and I, you know, I'm supporting design excellence. I would say that there's a kind of cost. There should be an economy to this once we get these these this program rolling. Eglinton Crosstown is our first opportunity to demonstrate that approach. But I think it's a good approach and a sound approach. And I look forward to hearing more from from your panel on how how, how we do that beyond just guidelines. Yes, and that's, uh, you're very correct and your observations are, are valid and certainly the design excellence team is, uh, is, is well aware and, uh, and uh, working forward uh, to, uh, to achieve those accomplishments. John, I asked about this one only because both the design and the colors look different than what we normally see, but I that's take right. the point that Mike's made that this may not be a... It doesn't look bad, but it's just... I didn't say it was bad, around. no, it looked different. This was the design that was going to go across the, the, the province or that across our, our, uh, our region, then that would be one thing. But if we're going to every, uh, every time, sort of pretty I think we heard the rendering doesn't do justice to it anyway. So. I'm sure it's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going, John. I slowed you down. Okay. That's okay. That's okay. Um, In two minutes, you're going to be cutting into Leslie's time. Well, that's okay. I'll cut into Leslie's time. <laughs> Uh, Union Station, so of course increasing uh, capacity in Union Station is essential for uh, the success of RER. Um, the next major project at Union is to build a new south platform which uh, will also be wider than the current platforms. Um, this will be done by removing one of two former <laughs> freight tracks uh, without platform access and building a new platform in its place. To build this platform, there's extensive work required below track level to provide stair and elevator access. The RFQ for this project will be released in uh, early 2017. Uh, as far as upcoming enabling uh, uh, works, um, uh, as part of the enabling works, a number of environmental assessments uh, are underway. On the Barry line, uh, for an additional track, wayside tracks and storm water management uh, from approximately the Lansdowne area to Allendale waterfront, plus a train layover in Bradford. Uh, electrification EA is proceeding. Um, and on Lakeshore East, uh, a new fourth track between Don River and uh, Scarborough Go Station. Uh, also, environmental assessments uh, for six grade separation projects that you can see on the screen there um, have recently been completed or are underway. As well, uh, under the enabling works contracts, tunnel sections are being pre-installed under the tracks at various stations. Um, by pre-installing the tunnel section, it reduces the amount of service disruption and cost going forward. And then station and track week work will be uh, completed under future contracts in uh, package two and package three. As part of RER, there are a number of uh, new or widened bridges required. Um, so two examples are shown here. This includes a new rail-to-rail -rail grade separation at uh, Davenport on the Berry Corridor. And another example is the Rouge River Bridge, uh, which needs to be widened and has uh, high public visibility. This is, will be done recognizing heritage attributes of the existing bridge, and the design of this bridge will be uh, visually compatible but distinguishable from uh, heritage att attributes of the existing bridge. As Bruce mentioned, this week we opened the new Gormley Station north of the Richmond Hill Goal Station. Uh, the new Downsview uh, Park Station on the top left on the Berry Corridor is under construction and it will open in conjunction with the Spadina Subway Extension. The main construction contract for the Bloomington Station at the bottom on the Richmond Hill Corridor will be awarded this month. Uh, enabling works at Bloomington are already under construction. And the new Caledonia station, uh, top right on the Berry Corridor, that station connects with the uh, Eglinton Crosstown. Um, it's recently received environmental approval and it's going to uh, go forward as a design build contract. Following package one enabling works contracts there are the procurements for packages two off corridor works and package three on corridor works. Uh, all using the alternative financing and procurement model. Um, development of these AFPs is already underway, working together with Infrastructure Ontario. And we're also looking to uh, uh, see how we can best incorporate new service initiatives that were last announced earlier this year um, into those programs. And the package two off corridor works uh, will be procured under the AFP model, and package two includes new stations, state of good repair, and, uh, and other initiatives that you can see on the screen. 
Package three on corridor works, again, will be procured under the AFP model. Um, we're working with industry consultations right now to uh, determine the exact model and we'll be coming forward uh, in the near future to uh, advise you of that. Um, and package three includes tracks, signals, communications, electrification, vehicles, and corridor maintenance. Given that the RER program is our largest by far, and in fact, it's probably the largest regional commuter expansion in North America, to successfully deliver the program, we need design, construction, maintenance, and uh, operating partners who deliver on schedule, on budget, and with a high regard for design excellence, the community, and our customers. The way we've structured our procurements gives the industry an opportunity to ramp up to meet that challenge. And we've been and continue to outreach to the industry to gain feedback and build interest in our upcoming work because we certainly want the best in the world and the best competition that we can achieve to bring the program forward. Um, we've been engaging the industry um, to help us prepare for the upcoming procurements and because they'll invest in resources and capacity um, if there's uh, a long-term opportunity. And the fact that the RER program is funded is a tremendous benefit and uh, very positive for the industry. In fact, we carried this message to the recent uh, Canadian Council of Public-Private Par Partnerships Conference in Toronto. That conference attracted worldwide attention. Um, we spent several days following that conference uh, meeting with over 40 companies uh, looking, uh, who were looking to better understand our program and sharing information of our program. And we've also uh, started market sounding with, with potential bidders um, to get their perspectives on uh, whether we are or not on the right track. Uh, there's a vast amount of global expertise out there and our objective is to tap into it and take advantage of it. As for next steps, uh, we plan to bring forward seven large contract awards in 2017. Uh, we'll also confirm the procurement plan for the new initiatives. Each, and each, each of these is over 100 million. Is that's that right. right. Not 100 yeah. million in total. That's right. Each of them over 100 million. And then, as, as, as always, we will continue to report back to the board on uh, our RER procurement process. So I thank you. That uh, thank you very much, John. What's, what's your greatest worry in executing this? Do you say you're on, we're on? If all this works out, we're on track. We'll be on budget. We'll get the job done. What's the what's the at this stage? What's the greatest uncertainty for you? Um, I think the uh, the greatest uncertainty right now is um, um, making sure that we have actively engaged with uh, industry at large and particularly globally make sure that the broadest spectrum of uh, potential bidders or contributors to this program are aware of the program, interested in the program and coming to the table because we really do want to make sure that we have a very robust competitive market as we go forward with these programs. So you're optimistic that the environmental assessments and related community engagement pieces of this um, are not going to be showstoppers? Well, as with any program, uh, the environmental assessments and, and community engagement are critical elements in the program. Um, the focus on the on the um, making sure that uh, the community is well engaged and that we're moving those assessments forward in a meaningful uh, and consultative way is, is first and foremost in our minds. And uh, we have a high degree of confidence that the program is moving forward the way it should be moving forward. Any questions for John and Mike? Bonnie. Just a quick one. <clears throat> on one of your slides, you mentioned design build capacity is needed. Are you talking about on your own staff with that kind of background? Uh, I'm, I'm actually speaking about uh, uh, the market to make sure that there's full design build capacity in the market. And that's, that's why uh, we're so actively pursuing industry outreach to make sure that we bring uh, sufficient players to the table to uh, have market ca capacity to deliver. Because I think we can appreciate that um, uh, there's a lot of work going on, not just on regional express rail, we've got the light rail projects, but more broadly there's work generally going on in Toronto, Ontario, in Canada, and uh, we want to make sure that we're, we're generating a robust response to, uh, to our programs. We currently have, uh, we, we currently have uh, very strong confidence that uh, the capacity is there and the marketplace is coming to the table and we've seen considerable interest. Just a quick follow-up. Um, so from these industry outreach conversations, there's no 
new flag emerging around the scope and scale of these contracts, which is which are quite large as they're packaged. That hasn't emerged directly with you. Uh, there's no flags emerging. Um, I would I would restate it and say that the purpose of those industry outreach ses sessions is to test um, our thoughts around the procurement strategies to make sure they're consistent with the thinking of the marketplace. And we're perfectly prepared to make adjustments in that strategy to align with what the market is telling us so that, again, we can move forward in the right way. Yeah. Because I, I think in referring to something like the Car Eglinton Crosstown, that was such a big package that had to go out. It was hard to get bidders who could meet those expectations. So I think if we can control design excellence at, at our end, we can put those packages out as smaller rather than such a big contract that had to go out. I mean, they're sort of a double-edged sword, right? You have to deal with more contracts, but you actually are able to distribute the work to a broader marketplace and get maybe better competitive bidding. And that's exactly what we're, we're checking with the industry right now to see what works best for them in terms of uh, size of package and type of package and what, uh, what, uh, what's effective for them. We are seeing, um, we are seeing large global players uh, coming to the table who are indicating to us that they have capacity to deal with um, uh, programs of the scope and scale that we're talking about and they have the experience in delivering those. Uh, but we're also testing the, the, the size of packages and what, what's the sweet spot to, to bring the right number of players to the table and to, to bring them to, a, to the table in an effective way that will get the best outcome for us. I think those are very, very good answers. I've got Carl and then Upcar. Thank you. On page 14 of the report, uh, this is uh, future procurements for packages two and three. Um, I think some of the earlier slides, that's 2019, is that correct? Uh, just which one is which? I've just got to get to the right slide. Slide 14, future procurements. Okay, just a minute. Let's say 14. There. there we go. And I'm sorry, what was your question again, please? I am referencing uh, an earlier slide in terms of the timing of this. That, that's 2019. Yeah, the future procurements for package three, if that, that's what you're referring to, is 2019, early 2020 is when those procurements will go out. Okay. And package one, enabling works, has been designed to be completed in time for those procurements to go out so there isn't a conflict. And to the extent that we have work in package one that spills into package two and three, we can move it into package two or three to make sure that it moves forward. So this was the expansion of the RER to, to other areas. That's right. Okay. John, I just wanted to clarify and build on Mary Ann's point. The other consideration I see we're taking into account is not only the management difficulty of multiple consortiums bidding, you want higher, a higher number to get the best price, but also the integrative aspects of doing different pockets of work that need to work seamlessly as an integrated whole. That's right. And that's, that is really first and foremost, was first and foremost around our consideration of the procurement plan that we put together, particularly with packages two and three, um, is managing that very complex integration risk that we see with programs of this scope and scale and recognizing that um, if a private sector bidder is going to come to the table and effectively deliver and manage, um, in most cases, it's better for them to have control of those integration risks to the greatest extent <coughs> possible and we get the best outcome as opposed to us trying to manage those integration risks. So that's a very good point. John, this is excellent, but you're 11 minutes into Leslie's time. So unless someone has an urgent question, I'm going to suggest you feel free to stay at the table, but make space for Leslie and anybody who's with Leslie. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank, thank you. Very good job. Please stay right on course. <coughs> Leslie, thank you very much. You've got two decks, and we've got 30 minutes to do the pair of them. Right, station access, mm -hmm. and the second one is um, new stations. The new stations. Okay, so they got both. Could you begin by introducing your team, please? Yes. So I'm. This is assisting me is uh, Lorna. They are director of project plan, project devel program development, <laughs> and Alana Horowitz, our uh, director of uh, project planning, yeah. manager of project <laughs> planning. Sorry, it's been a long day. Um, I have we should take this occasion to congratulate Lorna on her new appointment, heading back to the city of Toronto as director of urban urban design. urban design. You've been terrific here. 
we're sorry you're going back to our sister um, uh, agency, part to our partner, but we know you'll be a great partner over there as you've been a great partner here. So congratulations on your new appointment. You've been a real, really positive force here. Okay, Lash. Uh, so I will start with the station access plan. Um, uh, this is um, seeking the board's approval uh, to endorse the uh, station access plan itself. Uh, subject, of course, to any modifications the board uh, requires at this point, and uh, that we would report back uh, annually on the progress to meeting the station access plan. The reason we have uh, the timing of review of the access plan, which was originally set out in 2013, is really to begin, not to begin, but to com incorporate uh, the additional stations and the changes to the service plan introduced with the regional express rail, uh, to um, uh, sort of undertake uh, some additional work that we had done as a business case with regards to station access and to identify a series of strategies to further expand our work on multimodal access to the station. This, this document will be a, a, f a foundational piece to inform our capital uh, program. Uh, in, the, in its essence, the 2016 station access plan seeks to do what I would refer to as a bit of an inversion from our current day situation. Uh, the chart on the left shows uh, today the proportion of access to our station that is 62 percent uh, primarily uh, uh, accessed by automobile and the green 38 percent is in the other category. Uh, what we are suggesting in our new access plan is that we reverse uh, over the course of time uh, that uh, so that the parking access um, <coughs> remains at about a uh, six, 36 to 38 percent proportion while increasing, but the proportion relative to the other modes of access. The little chart on the right is actually showing today how people currently get to our GO stations. Uh, in order to develop uh, the plan, we examined three scenarios about how to advance towards that goal. Uh, we looked at what would happen if we continued with business as usual, uh, how we could uh, modify and move towards a better uh, shift in the modes through incre incremental change, and what would happen if we uh, undertook what I call substantive uh, step change and different types of partnerships uh, with municipalities and others. Uh, in doing that work, the incremental change scenario uh, proved to be the highest performer for a couple reasons. One, it maximizes ridership in the most effective and economical way, a more sustainable way, and it strikes a balance between sometimes competing priorities, uh, that is what our mandate at the regional level and the objectives and context at the local level. So the chart on the right uh, sort of summarizes uh, the key recommendations. Uh, we are rec recommending uh, approximately a 24% increase in parking for the existing stations, uh, which is a 34% increase overall. And a new modified version of reserved carpool and electric vehicle parking. Uh, we are recommending a targeted frequency increase in high performing routes uh, and reducing uh, transfer fares. Uh, this is linked to our work on the uh, fare integration. And we are also uh, recommending in this plan that there be significant improvements uh, that we will work with municipalities and even within our own programs, but improving non-parking modes such as walking, cycling, and bike parking in terms of the actual infrastructure needs. Uh, the what does the line manage subscriptions to support off-peak customers refer to? Is that the person who wants to park at the station at noon instead of at 6.30 a.m.? That's right. So, so uh, linking about how we uh, offer reserve parking to provide some parking availability uh, for the off-peak. <coughs> There's two more sentences. <laughs> if I have a reserve parking place, can't I use it any time of day? So we're looking at modifying that, that uh, system so that it would be more of a pool of reserve spots versus an individual parking spot. It's so we can optimize. There is, even though we have reserve spots, there are actually some of them, they aren't used 100% of the time. We, Even though people, we yeah. might have and definitional and then, questions. And, and, yeah, and then Rahul. Couple definitions. Go for it. Go 
have you uh, a couple of questions? Have you looked at the um, impact of this scenario uh, on a uh, and applied it to station by station, and yes. particularly the, yes, and particularly those stations where there have been complaints yes and unhappiness yes, and does this scenario bring happiness? Yeah, well, I don't know if I can be responsible for all human ha happiness, but um, uh, what the, the stats you're showing are the averages. The plan itself drills down on a station-by-station -station basis, and it's not an equal distribution, obviously, amongst all the stations. It is customized in how we're recommending to the needs. And so, it, for example, a highly urbanized station will have a very different need than because this is access to many modes versus one that is in a somewhat more remote location with far less means of access. So well, it's, it's, it's so that's very good that you've done that. And one other follow-up question based on the discussion we had yesterday around thinking strategically going forward. Um, everything, the, the world's going to change. We talked about that. Have you thought about what happens if uh, AVs come in or um, yeah. Also, in th in th two things, A, technology, AVs, and AVs in assured, assured uh, model of use. And the second thing um, would be in, in terms of last mile improvements, linking it to the overall land use planning. Has any, I know it's very hard. Well, I'm going to just give one comment, and I'm going to ask Alana to elaborate. But the fact that we're actually acknowledging that there are other modes, which includes the way technology is used to access a station, and that it will play a more significant role in how you access the station is reflected in the, the, the flip, the inversion of the proportion. Uh, but maybe Alana would like to comment more on yeah, that. Yeah, so with things like AV and shared mobility, um, one of the things we, we're uh, promoting is uh, larger pickup and drop-off areas and different types of pickup and drop-off areas, understanding that a, that's going to be a bigger mode. Um, as well, uh, we're reducing the number of parking structures that we're recommending because there may be places where you don't need the parking structure longer term. And, so it's and more space, less structural. That's right, looking for things that are a little bit more flexible. It's yeah. also economically not totally, not very sustainable to continue building more and more structures. You know, I'm, with, uh, I'm yeah. with that. And then the other thing is, if we ever do succeed in moving ahead with the last mile connections, you know, people won't necessarily be driving to these places. They'll be having a better option. Yes. Thank you. Just one definitional question. Can you clarify what you mean by microtransit? Yes. Little cars. Go ahead. So microtransit typically uh, refers to um, an on-demand, uh, dynamically rooted um, a transit service that's usually in smaller vehicles like uh, uh, vans. Uh, so it's really become uh, a force in the last few years and with the Uber advent. And Jitneys, that old yeah, that type of thing. So there's a, a company called Bridge that's doing it in Boston. Blank Ryan, um, yeah. yeah. So the, yeah. So the idea is that it can really serve um, some of the areas that you know conventional transit large buses can't serve. It also offers a really competitive option for people who may not be willing to sort of walk to a, a bus stop, wait for conventional transit, you can actually offer some door-to-door -door service. So are we thinking of coordinating that or factoring that into this? We're just, it's, 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 yeah. we're, we're saying that it's, a, it's an important factor in how we think about planning uh, about for access to our stations and designing for our stations. Um, just to, to wrap up on this topic, um, this slide sort of summarizes uh, the, the types of improvements uh, that we anticipate uh, once this plan is fully implemented, and I won't go into them in detail. Uh, the last, uh, this uh, second to last slide really talks about the targets for the access modes um, and the shift uh, we are uh, suggesting with the 2016 plan um, and the distribution. Uh, so the chart on the right shows that it, the tw so the 2013 plan had suggested a 50-50 split, uh, and this plan is really shifting that uh, in, in, in a different proportion, uh, as I explained before. Um, the timing of implementation? Well, this plan, remind me, it's a... Yeah, it's a, it's it, a 2031, but most of the implementation would be part of that package, it's, too. It'll be part of the RER uh, program that John just described. So this document becomes a complementary document to the requirements in the procurement. Uh, so this, this speaks to the timeline. Uh, and um, I think I will... The, only, the other key thing I want to mention is that we have not done this in isolation. Uh, our teams have gone and met with all the municipalities uh, across the region uh, with drafts of this work. Uh, 
with specific discussions about the specific stations within the municipality, uh, and we have a good support uh, to say that we feel comfortable that we've balanced the different needs with the objectives of the RER and the local objectives. That being said, uh, this is at the plan stage. We will continue to work at the local level uh, to refine uh, with uh, the municipalities in, at a more detailed scale. And uh, really, that is really what I wanted to job, focus on. So I'm intrigued by the inversion that you're aiming at. Mm -hmm. I want to look at slide eight for a second. And what I want to understand is, is that inversion, is it aspirational or is this sort of, sort of a realistic target that you're looking at? And what I'm driving at specifically is on the access modes and targets. On the pedestrian and the cycling side, your, your plan has got a target of fairly significant percentage enhancements to what's already going on. And how realistic is this in terms of you know, winter and the distances people have to walk and cycle and like how realistic is that? So we feel it is actually very achievable. There are examples around the world. We are not near there and we feel if we do not uh, uh, pro proactively promote this, it will not happen by nature. Uh, we have partly because the investments need to be uh, directed towards this uh, this proportion. Right now, every investment in the infrastructure historically has been directed to make car access the most, from an infrastructure investment standpoint, the priority. This is starting to say that going forward, uh, it's going to be more important uh, to have a better infrastructure to support this type of access. There's a lot of culture uh, in certain parts of the region, not in all parts. And there are parts of the region that may even already have that existing uh, mode split, uh, I would say in the more urban areas and in the less uh, urban areas. Uh, but that, it, that nuance is reflected on the station by station uh, uh, targets for each, for all. Uh, Let me throw yeah. just on one touch more yeah. then. So that's an, these are averages yes, you're looking at. Yes, yes. Okay, so there, yeah. Because you know what I'm driving at, yes. obviously. We've been hearing for the longest time about the last 100 meters or the last, 100, yes. or the last yeah. kilometer being so critical to the usage of this. And I just can't get my head around the cycling and the pedestrians yeah. out in Bloomington in winter. Yeah. So each station. Oh, pretty nice out there on a cycle. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was going to say, Roll it is actually quite nice. Uh, so each station, that, that's what that little funny illustration is showing. In the plan, there's a very specific station by station description. Uh, we feel it's realistic, but at the same time, pushing the target a little bit, not too far out of uh, reality. Uh, and it's a fine balance. We will continue, as the recommendation is suggesting, to come back to the board annually to uh, describe our progress and as such whether or not we need to modify or shift the targets. So that's an average then we're looking yeah. at those targets. Do we have any measures, Leslie, or maybe Lauren Alana would know the answer to this, as to what kind of uptick we get in cycling when municipalities invest in making it better? Like in Toronto, <coughs> Bloor Street is now busy with bikes every, mm -hmm. every 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 morning. Is 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 that where we're gonna get the one to two to four percent increases from moves like that? And are we seeing that kind of increase when cycling infrastructure is built? Uh, I don't, I, yeah, I mean, we, we haven't been measuring it to, to date. There hasn't been a lot yet, yet so far around GO stations. There's been a few, a few examples. Um, but I think that's what we're, we're hoping to. And we do want to do more measurement. Uh, we're also looking a big part of the bicycling infrastructure improvements is secure bike parking, which we've heard from customers is, is a big incentive. Say, I couldn't hear Secure that. bike parking. So providing parking that's in a secure area, if, not if people, just sheltered. If people leave their bike there for a whole day yeah. before they come back from work, they want to feel comfortable, and that is a deterrent to use bringing a bike. And are we building that into our station yes. designs? Yeah, so that's one of the big recommendations in this. Great. Ian and then Upcar. Uh, that was, you just, did, you just asked the one question. I'm, I'm assuming this work is being coordinated with the work that we just heard about before and, and that, that whole process so that we're going to be giving um, targets and philosophy, but at the same time, you're being very sensitive to the fact that there are widely different conditions yeah, throughout our system yeah. where cycling's a long way right. off and in other areas where it's much more important, so we're being sensitive to that in the design. Yeah. The That's what I loved about this yeah. report, yeah. Yeah. is that yeah. because it aggregates to averages, it doesn't look quite as striking, but it's the sensitivity station <clears throat> by station by yeah. station to what's needed so that you're doing massive parking increases where that's what's necessary and you're not doing it where it's not necessary. Correct. Instead of the same size. All. It's not one size it's fits all. It's not one size yeah. fits all. Correct. It's really good. Upcar? 
So, Chair, I just want to clarify. I think, let's see, what you're referring to is building access for cyclists to go to GO train stations, right? As that, uh, and I think, Chair, what you're referring to is the increase in cycling generally, which may or may have a per peripheral effect in those that access some of the transportation hubs like GO stations. Am I understanding yes, that? Yes, and they, this is my point about we have to work very closely with municipalities mm -hmm. because it, you know, our part of the access for cycling is connecting to a cycling network, right. uh, not just to get in and out of the GO station. Yep. So, yes. Sure. Okay, Leslie, I think we're all keen on that. We'll get the, we'll take a resolution first on, on, on access. And for who moves it and, and seconds <laughs> it. Does anybody dissent? Nice job. Approve. Now we're going to do um, the new station update. Just bring us up to date how we're doing with our partners on all the new stations. Okay, so uh, there are two items uh, to you've this. Got, you've got 10 minutes left. How many? Ten in total. Okay, ten. I will be so maybe questions. the short version. I won't even do my presentation. Um, first of all, welcome Brian Gallagher, our uh, senior manager, uh, who's been instrumental on this file. Um, mm -hmm. uh, since June, when the board agreed to the tw twelve new stations, uh, we've had been able to achieve two two very important things on a, a high level, and it's in uh, your slide um, with regards to our discussions with the city of Toronto. Uh, and as you may have seen in the Toronto reports, uh, we've been able to secure the what we had asked the City of Toronto for with regards to co uh, confidence on the locations, this, the six locations in Toronto, and they have uh, also agreed in, di in dialogue with the province on the uh, funding mechanisms for those six, um, for, uh, for the smart track uh, stations. Um, the second thing is that with the remaining municipalities, we now have received confirmation from all of them outside of Toronto that they too are, uh, and they most of them, have, all of them have gone through council, uh, their own councils, and uh, they have confirmed that uh, they are in agreement with our site selection and um, the way forward to be integrated as part of the GoRER program. So really, um, that's what this report is letting you know. Uh, there is much more work still to be done on a station-by-station -station basis, but I'm happy to um, uh, report that that's it. And really the recommendation is that we incorporate, we continue to incorporate the 12 new stations uh, as we had, uh, as the board had approved in June of 28th of this year, and that we begin to uh, develop more um, formal uh, arrangements in writing with the municipalities. Sounds like you've done a hell of a job, Brian. Thank you, sir. Brian. Oh, and with the team, the yeah. team effort. <laughs> what have we heard from the municipalities that didn't get stations, that won them? It, interestingly, not too much. Saw some. Yeah, early, there were. Saw you, some early correspondence. Yes. Yeah. There. I would. I would. I should. The four, remember there were four stations that we had said we need to do further work on. So we've been in dialogue with them. Uh, those are Concord, Park Lawn, Walker's Line, and Woodbine. So those are ongoing conversations. Uh, other than that, I can't say we've had anyone. I haven't. I don't have an inbox of of harsh emails on that front. <laughs> Howard. So, Leslie, is there, in terms of the four additional stations that in dialogue on, is there a cutoff in terms of when uh, they can or cannot be yes. uh, increased? So in, and I didn't include it in this report, but uh, in the city's report, uh, City of Toronto staff report that the council approved, there was a clear, and they refer to it as a stage gate process, that they worked with us and uh, John's team to align our procurement pr process with their decision-making process. And there are uh, what I call um, progressive points of um, uh, ability to b uh, uh, sort of say no. And, and we basically, I can't remember the exact stage, but there is a stage by which, did I, is June, it in here? June 2018 June, is June the final June stage. June 2018, uh, where it's the last opportunity for the city to, I guess, to use your term, uh, withdraw their funding. Okay. But it is a progressive, and, the, uh, I, you know, it was, uh, I would say we've worked very well in good faith with the city on this, so our, we're all, we're both parties very hopeful this, this will conclude well. And you'll give us time for two or three rounds of debate on the names of the stations? <laughs> Five stations. That's a whole other report. <laughs> <laughs> a whole other report. 
Any you can other, each uh, get a station. <laughs> This is very positive that, every, all, yes, we, that I, all our partners have come to the table. Yeah, and I'd like to, you know, to, That's really good. to thank the Ministry of Transportation, the municipalities themselves for their cooperation, the staff teams internally. Um, you know, it, it's, uh, it's, it's a huge step forward, so we thank everyone for that. And how many stations will we have then in total in the system? Um, including the ones that get added. So we're adding, I think, a total of 20, but with the... Ex yeah, 24 planned and proposed. Yeah, that's so we're counting the ones for the Bowmanville extension, the Kitchener extension, How and then I total will we have in the whole system total stations when we're done? 80. 88. 88. Right. 80. 88. 88. 88, yes. That's a big chunk. That's a big chunk. Yeah. A big, these are big meaningful. Deal. These are. It's almost doubling. Yeah, these are discon yeah. discontinuous increases. Yeah. It's great. So, Bonnie. This might be irrelevant to this discussion, so we'll rule it out of order, Mr. Chair, but if you think about all our focus on new and proposed stations, when you look at stations that might need adaptation to help us meet some of those goals, is that also a piece of work that's underway? That's embedded in the station access plan that I presented before. It so dealt with both existing at. and new. And new. Okay. Yes. Thank you. You want a resolution yeah, endorsing? Go forward with a dozen. Carl, you move that. Up, Carl, you second that. Mm -hmm. Any dissent? There's no dissent. Unanimously approved. That's very good work. Thank all you. three of you. Thank you very much. Um, that brings us to the community benefits agreement. Judy Pfeiffer. Where's Judy? Right behind me. Judy, you can make this pretty snappy because we read about it in the newspaper. Yes. I, <laughs> um, and Jamie, Jamie Robinson beside you, you guys can make this a bit of a victory tour. Nice work. Yeah, so really uh, just wanted to say that we secured a first community benefits agreement. And the reason I wanted to sit here was I wanted to acknowledge Jamie's work on the stakeholder engagement and bringing all the parties together along with Crosslinks. And uh, we can answer any questions on this agreement. Jamie, take a couple of minutes, a bit of a bow. Nice work. <laughs> Give us your thoughts about this. Um, I, I your think level of pride, your level of pleasure. It's gener how, how well can it be generalized I think across it's a, the province? Uh, what, are, what are some of the thoughts you have? Uh, Chair, this is, I think it's a terrific um, uh, agreement we, 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 we've reached here. And I think it speaks to, again, the leadership that coming from the board back in 2013 and really how we've all, uh, Metrolinx, been able to flow through, through that with the um, uh, community benefits framework that we have with the Toronto Community Benefits Network, and then working with all the parties as we've uh, uh, worked through some of the really uh, complex issue around uh, uh, targets and uh, that uh, the community wanted. And so we've, we've really worked hard at this together, and it's really been a collaborative effort, uh, both with Metrolinx and all the players that signed the declaration. So it culminated yesterday with a, with a tremendous achievement. And I think what was most exciting, I think to, to Bruce and I who were there, was to see the um, uh, see the Premier and the four ministers who were there with the, uh, a lot of the apprentices up there uh, that are, are going to be part and working on the Crosstown. And this really is the changing face of, uh, of, of, of the labour uh, force in, in Toronto. And so I think it's, uh, it's terrific that's uh, what we've been able to achieve. Thank you. I think Rahul deserves first right of comment because it was Rahul and Francis Lankin mm -hmm. who were the great champions of this initiative yes. in the earliest days of this idea of taking root. So congratulations, Rahul, and Thank you. take, the, Actually, take yes. the floor. It's, it's fantastic to see, and it's uh, long overdue, and it's a smart thing to do. So great leadership on behalf of Metrolinx, and great to see it scaled up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's brought into the culture, and you can see how it'll get scaled up across the, uh, the whole enterprise. I guess my question is, is where do you take it from here now? I mean, as you've created this really interesting model that's brought the parties together, <laughs> it's made it a real tool out there. How do you get it to other agencies and, and how do you sort of track the benefits of this so you can continue to lead it out and help scale it up even further? So we, we, we've just launched it on the Crosstown. We have a lot of opportunities within the Metrolinx family. There's the Finch West project, there's Huron Ontario, there's Hamilton LRTs, and then there's the RER program. Um, so you've got that as a clear defined path. At the same time, there's new provincial legislation that talks about community benefits, which takes it into a much broader scale. So to some way, we're leading the path in, in advance of that legislation to frame how it should be implemented, what works well, and how to, uh, how to make this a success. It's, we have to carve out some time on Judy's schedule to go on the speaking tour with this. Yeah. <laughs> 
Jimmy does a pretty good job of getting out there. Yeah. Um, does anybody else want to ask about this? Bonnie. Just a question. I think this is mm -hmm. fantastic, obviously, and, mm -hmm. and there's a, a fairly significant move in the higher education mm -hmm. system, whether it's at the apprenticeship level or uh, doctoral degrees, to move into more experiential learning for young people, both at risk and, and in alternative uh, types of communities. So at this point, have you done any analysis that might shed light on the receptor capacity to manage a kind of scaling up that exists for us with the opportunity of new projects coming on board? That's a, that's a very important question, and, and, and that's why there's a, um, uh, while well, we were moving forward with our declaration around a, the, a target for apprentices uh, on the Crosstown, um, what, uh, what's been um, uh, said from the, the get-go, it's important to, uh, to have that, but you've got to have the pool to draw upon. And so that's where the Ministry of Advanced Education and Skills Development, working very, very closely with uh, uh, Toronto Employment and Social Services, they've got what's called a construction pathway pilot project. So they launched that officially yesterday as well. And so that's really going to create that uh, go out there to, to the priority neighbourhoods, to the priority com communities, to identify the, the folks from the historically disadvantaged uh, communities and equity seeking groups to really, what I would say, stock the pond. And so that's that's ultimately where, where CTS is going to be, the Crossings Transit Solutions on the Crosstown, will be drawing from to, 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 to those apprentices to bring on to the project. Thank you. Anybody else on this? It's really good. Thank you. Proud to be associated with it. Yeah. Nice work. Yeah, yeah. Yep, thank you. Um, that brings us to Presto Progress Report. Robert, how are you doing with this rollout? What are you doing about these value-add machines? <laughs> Let's start with the good news. <laughs> um, we're on the verge of completing another major milestone for uh, Presto and the TTC. Two years ago, we made an agreement with TTC to accelerate the deployment of equipment, and over the past two years, we've deployed over 5,000 pieces of equipment on uh, streetcars, on subway stations, and buses, and paratransit vehicles, and we will, by the end of this year, have all of that equipment deployed, so Presto riders can start traveling with their Presto card and start thinking less of legacy uh, TTC fare media. That's involved a lot of work in stations and civil works and communications and power. And the teams, uh, together with the TTC, have, I think have done a remarkable job of advancing the, this deployment to be finished into this year. Um, and a bunch of statistics here, but uh, a lot of equipment, a lot of work, a lot of overtime to, to get here. Um, just a quick view of the volumes that have been uh, rising on the TTC. Last week we did over 900,000 taps on the TTC. And, and while our adoption rate's about 6 or 7%, we expect over next year, with all the equipment out, to uh, dramatically uh, raise that. Uh, just as a other point of context, uh, last month was the first time Presto overall for a month had over 20 million taps. So the volumes are rising very quickly. So device reliability, we've talked a, a little bit about, um, or was mentioned about the kiosks. We've had some challenges uh, reported in the fall about some readers on streetcar and uh, bus vehicles not being always available. So we uh, did a big triage around uh, all of the equipment. And because we had been deploying so quickly, we hadn't gone back to, to make sure we were fine tuning. So that works well underway. We've actually dramatically increased the uh, availability of uh, devices on vehicles to every vehicle having uh, at least one reader over 98%. Now, we will not be satisfied till that number is well above 99% when we get to steady state mode, but we want to make sure that those readers are available. Um, the real challenge we're having today, and it's been uh, reported by our customers in the media, and we are very dissatisfied with the, uh, the availability and reliability of these uh, self-service reload machines. They were, um, they were custom designed to meet the TTC's requirements to allow customers to check balances and uh, load value in stations. Uh, we did an or initial order back in 2013 for about 75 of these devices. And this first generation device has not lived up to expectations, as, as customers know. Uh, the uh, vendor is working very diligently to uh, track down the issues. I, I do want to convey that these devices were, went through our rigorous testing in the labs. These, these issues cannot be repeated in the lab. So the uh, vendors working on the street. That is, when we use them in the labs, they work fine. Work fine, 100% fine. So it has to be something to do with the way that the network is aligned in the, in the production world or the connection to our credit card uh, uh, supplier. But the uh, vendor has put um, um, sniffers, if you like, inside those machines, try to capture events so they can actually uh, triage the. So the vendor is very concerned about this, as we are. 
and they're working very hard. Uh, the other good news is we've now received uh, the Generation 2 machines, which are in our lab. They have new hardware, uh, Im improved uh, software. We're going to go through our rigorous testing again, and we'll also do field trials before we deploy them or, uh, sometime uh, in spring next year. So there is hope uh, coming. Now those first, how many machines was 75 machines? About 75 in the first tranche is and about 250. Throw. Do they get thrown away? Do they get replaced? No, we haven't. Who bears the financial responsibility for machines, which, according to some reports, you know, 30, 40 percent of them aren't working at any given moment? The accountability is with the vendor. We're working out an agreement where they will be either repaired to meet full specifications or be replaced with these Wave 2 machines at, at no cost to Metrolinx. So we'll, we'll come out whole in the end, but our concern at the moment is uh, customer, customer experience. Service. Yeah, and I would I would say that while these machines are are certainly imperfect, uh, they are performing about 5,000 transactions a day across those 75 machines. And in the Go concourse, the six machines often hit 800 transactions a day. So a lot of customers are being served, but uh, many are are being frustrated. And why were they custom designed? Why why why, why were the specs for these unique? <clears throat> to the needs of the TTC as opposed to an off-the-shelf product, which would be well tested and working well. It, it was built into the TTC agreement. They wanted a particular machine that would perform these functions, different from a, a full-function vending machine, which we are working on now for uh, next summer's uh, uh, deployment. And uh, the full-function vending machine we're looking at for, for next year is actually an off-the-shelf device that will be tweaked a little bit for our needs, whereas this machine was a custom-designed uh, unit. And therein, I think, uh, lies you know, some of the challenges. Ian, did I see a question? Uh, just quickly, of our payments, how much of them come through machines and how much comes through the web? Um, at this point in time, the, the number of transactions on these machines is almost approaching the web uh, Side. So even 75 of these machines are almost approaching the number of loads not performed on the web. Our customers like the idea of doing self-service. We just need to be able to provide them with a reliable machine. Or you had a question. Yes. Uh, two things. Will the, will the field, field trials uh, be uh, conducted in the highest, uh, be stressed really in the highest capacity area, highest traffic area, and will it be distributed throughout the system or will it be just be in one area? I think we, we're just working through our plan on this, but we, we first will we'll want to fence it in for our own purposes to make sure that we believe it's working in, in that environment. Then we will gradually turn that, turn that over to, to customers to, to start providing the volume, and we'll track it very closely. So we want to make sure the next machine works perfectly for our customers. So we'll, we will stage that to when we're comfortable getting it up to full volume. Rahul? Can you help me uh, think a little bit further out in terms of open payment into the system, so tapping credit cards and the sort? A, what's the game plan in that? And B, once that's actually deployed out there, what's the differentiated value that a Presto card holder would have over somebody that's just going to tap with their credit card? I'm just thinking about my experience in London recently in the UK. <coughs> you're just walking around, just tapping your, your credit card everywhere and getting the same access. Absolutely. So in our game plan, first of all, getting the TTC fully deployed, the next phase following late next year, early into 2018, we'll just, we just start introducing open payments, so-called open payments. So probably the first uh, phase, it'll be a multi-phase rollout. The first phase will be adult cards, your ability to tap a credit card that actually has a near-field chip in it, like many Canadian cards do. So you can literally replace your Presto card for those rides on, on the system. So that will be our first deployment. Then in future, we'll be looking at adding concession fares and, and other types of, of payments. But literally that, for, for many users, and we look at this at the beginning at least as complementary, if you want all the bells and whistles, the Presto card gives you the, the best value, gives you protection of your value, all those things that we um, offer today. Uh, for the credit card, it, it'll be more for folks who are doing single rides, um, infrequent rides rather than uh, full rides. But I would say in due course over the next few years, you'll see more and more folks, as you have in London, migrate over the, to a credit card as uh, their preferred uh, method of payment. To Robert's point, wait till you get your bill. I know. I It'll be a little bit more, my kids have pointed out. Yep. Yep. Oh, in, in London, do some people still use the card and others use credit cards? Yeah, the Oyster card is still the pre predominant method for, for payment. So for a tourist coming through, just using a credit card makes sense, but for a resident, they would typically use an Oyster card? 
to get the advantage of all the discounts and concessions and, and the like? Currency, currency exchange. Well, I think one of the, the there's been a, a very fast adoption in London of you people using credit cards, but it really boils down to whether your credit card is near field enabled, whether it's a tap card. Uh, the card companies in Canada have aggressively rolled out tap cards in, in Canada, whereas in the U.S. that's not the case. Uh, I'm not sure where they are in London, but it really depends on the marketplace. I would say in Canada because uh, most of us have tap cards in Canada that we, would be a faster adoption than it would be in other jurisdictions. And will the person using the tap card, this is three years from now, will they get all the same concessions and recognition and when they transfer and all the things they do? because the software in the back room <coughs> will treat that credit card just the same as a Presto card? That is the intention. In fact, uh, part of opening up for um, open payments is actually to move our decision-making back to the central system so that all cards in, in future, the decisions we made at the central system versus at the device on the bus. So that's also part of our migration. And in future, the Presto card could be adopted to be a credential, whereas it would get the same, uh, it work the same way as a credit card and the decisions are made in the central system. And that way we can streamline how we actually manage the fare systems in one place versus having to deploy that to thousands of devices. And your phone will be the same. Your phone, your credit card, yeah. or your Presto card, all will be, have the same, yeah. the same yeah. I'll get the same the app cost as a rider, regardless of which of those three instruments I use. Yeah, that, uh, in the steady state. Philosophically, but we have to talk to our transit agencies who actually set the fares and the policies around that to ensure that you know everyone's in agreement on how we actually deploy. Did you complete your report? I interrupted you. Well, there's a couple of other quick items I wanted to uh, talk about. So next year, now that we have um, devices across the TTC, we're going to be working with the TTC to start moving forward with. Um, their metro passes, working forward to encourage uh, customers to come over to Presto. This year, because we were in transition, we said use Presto when it's right for you. You still need to carry tokens and tickets. More so next year, you can start dispensing with tokens and tickets and go directly to your Presto card. So next year is all about moving the adoption across the TTC while continuing to build out other functionality that the TTC requires. I uh, just want to make a mention that in this quarter we uh, did a major data center move uh, and upgraded all the system software so that we're prepared for the huge volumes that are coming forward with the TTC. So we're in really good shape from an architecture and infrastructure point of view to handle the, uh, the future. Um, just lastly, as part of this upgrade we did... Ryan's got a question. No, no, no. Oh, keep going. Again? Sorry. Sorry. Uh, part of the upgrade is uh, folks who have been online see a major upgrade to our, our web services and we've had lots of accolades from clients about it's about time we improved our website and we, I think we've done a good job and we've heard uh, good things. Uh, last item I want to convey is that uh, Metrolinx and the 905 Partners plus Ottawa have been working very diligently over the past couple of years to be prepared to uh, enter a new 10-year agreement. The 10-year agreement uh, expired in October this year. And we we're working towards a new 10-year agreement with Metrolinx over the next 10. We provided uh, some, a couple of uh, one-month extensions to get to ground, but we're very close to uh, landing an agreement with uh, the 905 partners. Uh, you may have read that the uh, Ottawa has already agreed to the terms for uh, entering in the next 10-year agreements, and we're very close with the 905 partners to reach that too. And that sets the stage for uh, another 10 years of working very closely with our partners to, to grow Presto out uh, into the future. That would be all I'd want to raise today. That's very good, very good Robert, and thanks for all you're doing. Um, Brian. My question is really maybe it should be directed to the TTC, but you talk about the rollout and you had the little show where you won't have to have tokens and so on in the future. Has TTC set a date when they're going to uh, eliminate tokens in their entirety? Uh, we haven't set a specific date. Uh, we, we've always agreed that once we're ready, once all the functionality is there and all the equipment's out there, uh, we'll work with the TTC to you know, very quickly move towards re removing fair media. Um, so we, that's the next conversation we need to have with the TTC. We'll start introducing passes early next year and other fair products so that there'll be a point, I would say, sometime later next year when we're in a position to be start thinking about withdrawing certain fair media, but we haven't had that discussion or landed any particular dates yet. Okay, thanks. So 2017 is gearing up in terms of volumes, but it isn't to the new world. It's it's on it's a march on the way to the new era, but 2018 is the earliest 
Yes, if I was to if, forecast, if, if, I if you were to guess, and I realize you're not speaking for TDC, you're yes. speaking for your best guess based on your conversations. Is it 2018 before we're into the world where basically virtually everyone is using some version of Presto? I, I'd say somewhere later next year that you know that starts to that starts to begin. And then well into 2018 could be a point where uh, much of the legacy fair media has been retired. That, that would be my forecast, but as you say, I haven't uh, had that discussion with the TTC yet. And when does a Presto card represent a Metro Pass? When does it, imp when does it do give you equivalent? I know it's not identical, but when, when will people be confident, I can use my Presto card, I don't have to buy a Metro Pass? So we're working with the TTC right now. Very early next year, we will start opening up uh, the system to allow passes to be stored on, on your met, on your uh, Presto card. So all the logic's been in place for some time is a question of getting devices out so that a pass holder can tap everywhere. And now we're, we're uh, just discussing with the TDC very early next year to, to launch that. All right. As the Presto card evolves into a Presto application, and my assumption is that it will roll out into the retail sector. That will not only be Metro, or will it be able to be like the Oyster card, for example, or the Octopus card? Well, that, that is, hasn't been in our strategic direction. Our strategic direction has been to, to advance the, a card across other mobility options, like shared bikes or shared cars. And to, to be actually a, a payment card, a generic payment card, really only Oyster is the only company that's gone that direction, and they, they went that way a long time ago. Um, that would put us in competition with other card uh, issuers and we don't think that's necessarily where we want to go. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions for Robert? Do you want anything on this, Bruce? Sounds good. Well, uh, yes, I, I would say that uh, uh, we're very pleased and proud of the, the work that the team, both at TTC and Presto, has done to get us to the point where we'll achieve the deployment across the, the network by the end of the, 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 the calendar year. Um, uh, we also realize that uh, you know, the, fundamentally the, the system needs to be stable and people have to have confidence in it and it's not acceptable frankly where we are with the SS or the self-service reload machines at this point in time and we need to work with the vendor to resolve that issue. So that is something that's uh, very much on our mind is to make sure that uh, uh, we get for our customers, for the TTC's customers, you know, the kind of reliability that they, they, they should expect. And we fully concur with that. We will not be satisfied till every customer gets served well. Thank you very much, Robert. Good work. Don't take a long break over Christmas, though. No breaks. <laughs> no breaks in Presto. <laughs> Stick with it. But we are going to have every station done, right, by the 31st of December? Yes, only seven to go. No, seven to go. By the 23rd. Or, uh, 23rd is the date to celebrate? Okay. Yeah. Take the 24th off. Celebrate Christmas or something. Yeah, it's the afternoon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the next item on the agenda is the Auditor General's report. Um, and Robert Siddle, our Chief Financial Officer, is going to report on it. It's obviously a less happy topic than some of the others. So, Robert, why don't you get it on the table? Bruce, why don't you add any comments you have? And then we'll open it up for discussion. But I think we should let Robert make his report before we jump in. Okay, thanks, uh, Rob. Uh, I'd like to uh, first of all start by acknowledging the hard work of my uh, internal, our internal audit uh, department uh, that is headed up by Peggy Gilmore and, and Greg Murphy, uh, her manager, spent a tremendous amount of time and effort uh, supporting this audit. Uh, Peggy was recently uh, recognized as one of the top 50 uh, diversity board members for her work previously on the Ontario uh, pension board and on the Ontario Power Generation Board. So uh, I think she's had a, a good introduction to Metrolinx uh, and we're lucky to have her on, on our team. I'll keep my comments short. Uh, as I imagine, there might be a number of questions. Uh, the Auditor General released her annual report on November 30th, 2016. Included in the report are the results of the value for money audit of the recently completed Metrolinx capital construction projects. Uh, their sample of projects was drawn from 520 construction projects costing a total of about $4.1 billion uh, that were directly delivered by Metrolinx rather than through an AFP process. Of the, hundred, of the 520 construction projects included in their sample, 275 of them represented projects 
completed during the period 2011 to 2016. And that excluded those projects that are related to CNCP. 82% of the projects that were sampled were under budget or were not over budget by more than 10% of the, of the budget for those projects. The main focus of the Auditor General's report is on 15 of the 520 projects that were selected in a category of greater than 30% budget, uh, budget overrun category. The average rate over the 520 projects uh, was 3.8% within budget. This rate compares well from what we've uh, been able to ascertain by looking at the work of KPMG on their 2015 Global Construction Project Owner Survey. So from our standpoint, the projects overall that Metrolinks are, are delivering are well within what is expected for a program of this magnitude. In total, the report includes 17 recommendations with 38 action items. Most of the concerns raised by the Auditor General were previously identified by Metrolinks over the course of these projects uh, that are referred to in the report, and the learnings coming out of our experiences in dealing with those projects has helped us inform and move forward the, our project controls over our capital program. For example, Metrolink started the process of reviewing all the procurement practices about three to four years ago at the request of the Audit uh, Finance and Risk Management Committee and at the request of the Board. So we spent a considerable amount of time and effort looking at our procurement practices as, as a corporation and, and setting out a plan uh, to implement better pa uh, practices over our procurement activities. Uh, some of those, uh, part of that plan included a recent implementation that started 18 months ago to put in a vendor management uh, performance system for Metrolinx, and, and that is to deal with not only those uh, vendors for which we've received poor performance, but also to recognize those vendors for which there has been great performance and to, and to recognize that performance in terms of procurements going forward. In addition, uh, Metrolinx over the past year and a half has created the Capital Projects uh, Group that is headed up by John Jensen uh, and has brought in significant international experience in terms of project management and project controls and one of those is, is Lisa Thomas that's sitting here as our Vice uh, President of Project uh, Controls. So we've done the, pro uh, the part of trying to move forward and get the expertise that we need, not just internally but also bringing in some of the best vendors in project management from around the world to help us uh, implement this great program. In addition to the management responses provided throughout the Auditor General's report, Metrolinx's senior management is developing detailed action plans uh, with milestones and timelines to address each of the report's recommendations and that support uh, the programs uh, that we've already initiated over the last couple of years. My promise to the board is that w internal audit will follow up on a quarterly basis on the 17 recommendations, that they will be properly assessed, and that the action plans will be implemented as quickly as possible. And that's my report, Chair. Thank you very much. Very straightforward, direct. Rob, work, uh, work, work to do. Brian, are you going to go first? Could I, yeah, could I just add something to it because uh, uh, the uh, audit risk and uh, or audit finance and risk management committee spent a fair bit of time on this at its meeting yesterday and uh, first of all we really did welcome the receipt of the AG's report and as Robert's already noted uh, many of the process and control issues that were identified in that report Metrolinx has already started working on or has indeed in some components already put in place um, but that isn't to say that it's all done and those action plans that Robert just mentioned uh, are on our agenda to be uh, reviewed and uh, and scrutinized at every board meeting until they're all in place. And uh, Robert and his team have assured us that they'll do that as he just did now as quickly as possible. So you'll, so, so you'll report back to so February. Exactly. Uh, I would suggest that we do so every every quarter uh, here on in. Uh, so. Uh, uh, but uh, could I ask a question while I've got the floor? Because sure. no, we've got the contractor guys here too, and uh, uh, it's always unfair to ask the finance people technical questions. But 
you know, I read in the paper that, did we really build an upside down bridge? Can someone <laughs> answer that question for me? So, Chair, maybe I can start and uh, have people fill in any details if, uh, if Brian, you'd like some more information. Uh, and the first thing I should say is, is that the, the trust, first of all, there's no bridge that's been installed upside down. <laughs> The trust that was referred to in the uh, in the auditor's general's report was actually installed in 2011. Uh, it was uh, installed at that time correctly, uh, and the bridge was actually open for public use in February of 2012. There was a second phase of the project, which was to basically add the architectural finishes <laughs> to the basic bridge, and uh, uh, that phase two was awarded to the same contractor because. In phase one, their performance was considered to be satisfactory. They were awarded the, the phase two contract. And uh, in that phase two contract, uh, one of the beams that was a very strategic beam that supports the, some of the architectural finishes was misaligned. And that was the, uh, that was the I think, the fun fundamental flaw in terms of finishing the architectural finishes and uh, ultimately led to our decision in the end to terminate our contract with the contractor and we now have another service provider under contract to deliver on those remaining architectural finishes and that's to be completed by summer of next year. Uh, this, uh, this episode has been obviously uh, uh, significant for the project but also in terms of how we've worked with the contractor. Uh, it was a, a significant factor in deciding in five subsequent uh, bids since 2013 to disqualify the contractor. Uh, so uh, uh, we, even when they've been the low bid and subsequent bids, we have not awarded the contract to them. So it has been a, uh, uh, again, a, a, a something that we expect to see good performance from our contractors and we want to reward those who are performing to expectation and recognize there has to be consequences when they do not perform to expectations. Thanks. So just to make sure I got it right, the shortcoming in the contractor's performance was on contract two, and so it wasn't that we had a bad performer and then gave them a second contract. It was in the second contract they malperformed with the result that you've denied them contracts. That's right. So subsequently. just to make it even a little bit more com uh, complicated, at Pickering Station there were actually three contracts, one to rehabilitate the station itself. This contractor fulfilled that contract uh, satisfactory to budget to schedule. Uh, there was a second competition to build the basic functional bridge. Uh, again, this contractor won that contract, fulfilled that contract uh, satisfactorily, and then they won the third bid to add the architectural finishes. And that's that third contract where they ran into uh, technical challenges in terms of their ability to deliver on it. Uh, so the two pieces that uh, are not finished at this point in time is, is that uh, uh, there are two stairways that go from the bridge down to the, the surface level uh, where those uh, shrouding that's around the bridge, an architectural finish, uh, has not been completed and that's what will be completed by another contractor over the course of the next uh, nine to ten months. And this same contractor, if I have it right, was also delivering a station Bloor and Dundas? Uh, that's right. So the same contractor, about the same time as uh, they were awarded the second contract for the, or sorry, the third contract for the architectural finishes. We're also awarded the contract for uh, the uh, the rehabilitation and expansion of the, the the Bloor station, which also is the Union Pearson Express station. Uh, so again, it was on the basis of uh, some of the performance in the first two phases, as well as other projects they've done on our behalf, uh, and uh, they also haven't performed to expectation on that project as well. Uh, and again, that's been contributory to the fact that we've disqualified them subsequently from bidding and receiving work in the future. Thank you very much. Um, so if I go around saying there never was an upside down trust, I'm on safe territory. Yes. Thank you very much. Bonnie. Just a couple of things that on, on, the, on this issue, which you've been very good at explaining to us. Um, there was also a, a media reference to us paying a bundle of money that while we canceled the contract, we basically paid it out. So maybe just the final bit of clarity on that one. It may not have been, I may not have read it right and it may not have been reported correctly, but if you could clarify that. And then secondly, in the uh, report that Robert presented, it talked about we're in the process of building a database that gives us a, uh, a much better 
uh, way of assessing performance and then applying that assessment to poor performers on future contracts. Are we 60% ready with that, 80% ready? percent ready where are we in that sure. in that exercise so there are uh, maybe answering your second question first uh, we as, as Robert indicated in his presentation we launched our vendor performance management system in January of 2015 so as it's been progress progressing we've been populating with more information as projects gets finished we get uh, records on the performance of those contractors so it becomes a more and more robust <laughs> tool as we as, as we get more information and data built into it. So it's fully implemented okay. is, is bottom line, Thank and it will become more and more valuable as we get more and more data input into it. The other thing we've so done- So just on that, so mm -hmm. when a contract's finished, that contractor is assessed- That's right. For how they perform, then they get a score, and that goes into the machine. That's right. So when they bid again, we have a score on their previous performance? That's right. Got it. And the second uh, change that we've made in the last few years is, is that uh, previously, uh, we uh, check the references of contractors uh, for the projects that they provide to us. So if they said they did projects A, B, C, and D, then we check the references on those projects. We changed our rules a few years ago to say that we can now check the references for any of the projects they've done for us in the past. And that means that we can go back and make sure that uh, all the work that they've done for us in the past is considered in the award of future work. So again, that is a, a really important uh, change in how we procure to allow us to take into account past performance. Even as the vendor performance management system is getting more robust, we also have that additional tool. That, that's good, because you can always give your best three references, but that's you right. may have five other back there. That's right, so we, we reserve the right to pick the references that we think are most relevant to, to ourselves. In terms of the, uh, the payout of the, uh, the phase three contract, uh, we did terminate the contract and we came to a settlement with the, uh, the company in terms of what would be the, the, the final value of the work that they ha actually had produced because uh, the majority of the architectural finishes have been completed on the bridge. There are just the, the two stairways that need to be completed. And through those negotiations and to avoid uh, a, a litigation process, we did come to a settlement and that did amount to uh, not quite the entire value of the contract, but uh, very close to the value of the contract was paid out at the time. Thank you. I have Howard and then Carl. So you in the process of the uh, construction on a project, do we have like a project review team that periodically meets with the, uh, with the contractor? to review the status of the project and maybe, in effect, uh, have the ability to capture some issues that may not be. Well, the best time to resolve issues with, it, with any project is during the project, not after the fact. And uh, we typically have our project manager as well as uh, uh, construction uh, administrators who are on site on a, on a daily basis in some cases to observe the work of the contractor and to identify issues as early as possible and resolve those er issues as quickly as possible. Uh, so that's a part of our standard process. And uh, you know some of the advice that we've received from the Auditor General is how we can strengthen some of those processes. And we, we welcome that and we, we see this as a, a, a path for continuous improvement. And we, we believe that there are ways in which we can improve the way in which we are uh, uh, providing uh, uh, oversight of the work that contractors are providing and making sure we get the best quality in the end. So there is, in some cases, daily oversight. There are people who are resident who are observing and watching and uh, providing reports and providing direction to the contractor on the site. Carl. Thank you. The evaluation system that you talked about a moment ago, as well as perhaps the, the, the inspection or the site supervision, uh, is this really any different than any other public agency or perhaps even the private sector in, uh, in contract administration? Uh, I'm assuming it's similar. How do we rank in comparison there? Are we um, neophytes at it or are we the most experienced in the system? Well, our systems date back uh, all the way through you know, Go Transit's 50-year history. So uh, it's been an evolution, obviously lots of experience in terms of uh, delivering projects of different scale in the context of transit, uh, uh, infrastructure, stations, track, signalization, vehicles, uh, ongoing services. So there's a lot of experience in the corporation on um, how to go about this. And we don't just use one single methodology. Uh, in fact, we use very little anymore low bid wins in most cases, and Robert can and provide more detail on this. 
we look at uh, obviously the, the bid value, but we also look at uh, lowest bid from a qualified uh, bidder. And the qualification goes into not just what is on paper, but our experience with the uh, with the contractor. And that goes back to the vendor performance management system and the references. And Robert? And, and, and John uh, Jensen and I were just talking about, uh, about an hour ago about the teams that we brought in to help us do this in terms of the some of the vendors, uh, like CMH2 Hill is our owner engineer, and and these are uh, teams that provide the same type of service on projects around the world. So we do have a world-class team that we're pulling together to, to manage projects. And, and some of these, uh, back to my comments, some of these projects go back, that the Auditor General is looking at, go back as far as 10 years ago. So there's been an evolution, and there will continue to be an evolution in terms of our continuously improving our practices. Marianne. Uh, maybe, you know, just to suggest when you say 10 years, the, the actual people who do the work are directed. There's corporate policy, but there's also those individuals who are stellar. There might be some ranking that rates the individual project manager or superintendent on the site because that's where the project actually happens, you know, with the oversight of a, of a larger yep. construction right. consortium. But it's so important. Absolutely. So. And where we find the most challenging part uh, that contractors face is not in specific technical elements, but it's more the project management skills mm -hmm. and bringing different subcontractors and how they work with the subcontractors, how they stage the work. Those are some of the areas that uh, uh, I would say contractors again need to get more and more uh, proficient in, in managing. And some of them, the majority of our contractors, you know, deliver uh, very, very good outcomes for us. Uh, and when I look at uh, out of that population of 275 projects that we completed over the five-year period, coming in within 3.8 percent of the, the 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 approved budget, uh, I would say that that ranks on a Canadian basis virtually with any other large deliverer of complex infrastructure. I, mean, I haven't had a chance to look through this thoroughly, but it does seem as though that's something that that getting a great quality of construction should be coming through the apprentice plan as well, sort of mentoring and tutoring to to that proficiency because I think it's you know sometimes lacking. It's a, it's a bigger challenge. Dr. Gold? I remember when I first joined the board about a couple of years ago and I was on a firm and I asked Bruce uh, what was our percentage you know, uh, how did we do on these projects overall? And at that time, I think it was 3.75 or 3.8 percent. And I thought we were fantastic. Um, and better, uh, better than your house renovations, probably. Yes, I said to I actually said to myself, I actually said to myself because we were in the middle of. I said if I could come in 3.8 percent on my own renovations, I would think I was a genius. Anyway, um, but uh, and and I realized the report focused on 15 of 520 projects, but. Um, do we do any benchmarking against other large expanding systems? Um, I would have to think, notwithstanding that we have improvements and we're open to doing that, and I applaud that, but I would have to think we're pretty good if yeah. we do that. Do we do the global benchmarking? Or? Uh, we've been working with all the firms, uh, like I said, either our owner engineer, CMH2 Hill, or uh, recently we had uh, KPMG in who uh, completed uh, a benchmarking exercise with TTC over the last year, and, and so we are talking to uh, some of the leaders in in the industry that that look at capital projects, and and I think they're, and we're having them come in and do audits of some of the the work that's done in the capital area. So I think we're pretty comfortable that that when you consider it, and again, I I, I want to make it abundantly clear that that the projects that we're getting are not very simple projects. I mean, we talk about risk management, and for us, we talk about utility risk. You know, we're, we're not building a, over a very small area. Right. We're building linear projects, and there are tremendous things under the ground that we don't really have good systems in the past 100 years to record what's underground, and sometimes those issues uh, come up, and we have to deal with them on the fly as a project team. So, I mean, again, I think if you consider the fact that what we're looking at in terms of the, the projects that we're delivering on and the complexity of those projects are our are, are, are performance is very good. And the tenure, the, the well, long-term, multi-year yep. projects. Well, and when we report, Bruce, do we, do we, um, uh, do we publicly report on, on, uh, on, on, on these kind of, this kind of data so people uh, realize that, uh, you know, that our record is mm -hmm. exemplary in many ways, not perfect? 
One of the things that uh, the team and I have been talking about is on a quarterly basis, can we start to release information, for example, of all the contracts we've awarded over the past, con mm -hmm. uh, over the past quarter? Uh, you know, that information in generally is already public, but it's not public in one single place. Mm -hmm. So how can we provide a more integrated uh, 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 source of information to show what is the experience and uh, uh, also report at the end of the contract? and. Uh, you know, we shouldn't forget that, uh, uh, you know, a large, over half of our projects come in not just at budget or below budget. Uh, so, uh, yes, there, there are always, whenever we talk about 3.8%, it's an average. So there's, there's uh, going to be, both on the left-hand side of the equation, projects that divert from the average. And, uh, but I think it's having more information out there is a good thing in this case. Robert, I'd be interested in at the next audit committee meeting, maybe having KPMG or who, someone else who does look more broadly come and talk to the committee about their impression yeah. of our performance. Or, I'm, it's not that I don't believe it when it comes from you, but I think for us to have a third party that is expert, has looked at it, and have them report directly, Brian, I think could be a, no, it, it, no. it could be a useful discussion um, no. to just get our, our confidence level as high as possible as to where we are and where we're located because there, there's clearly room for improvement. Okay. Uh, you know, as you said, there's all these 38 action items, a lot of them we have underway. There are others will get underway. You'll report in February on what you're doing. It will raise our game again, and there is room to keep raising it. So I'm all in favor of this effort um, um, of raising our game and having an outsider looking at us like a KPMG. I'm not saying them in particular, but whoever's most knowledgeable in this area, I think would be part of that helping us and maybe we'll have them come back a year later and give us a set tell us what they think of how we're doing um, I do think you should evaluate these recommendations carefully um, many of them I thought were terrific some I wondered whether it's actually in our interest to have higher liquidated damages in all cases for example because I think you tend we'll end up paying for that and will cost a lot to buy them we could buy them in every case but I think I actually hope our legal counsel and others will try to assess in each case what the right level is to pitch rather than aiming high at all times. Because that's So I think it needs some careful consideration, but we'll hear back from you in mid-February at our next, at the next meeting of A-Farm. And yeah, I, like, I, could just I like the spirit you're bringing to it. I, I could know. comment on the liquidated damages. That's one tool in the basket, uh, our toolbox. And, and what we like to do is, is to be able to use all the tools and use the right tool for the right risk. Exactly. So we need a systematic approach to it. We need to be thinking about it explicitly, self-consciously, before we enter each contract and assessing have we found the right balance point, as opposed to just saying more is better, because I think more is one level better, but it's ever more expensive and may not be worth it in some in some cases. But um, I like the attitude you're portraying on behalf of the team, and we'll look forward to the February report. Does anybody have anything else they want to raise on this? Thank you. Um, that brings us, we're making good progress. Mm -hmm. If you're setting your clocks, you can be confident we'll be done ahead of time today, which will be a change from my usual <laughs> laggard record of not being done on time. Uh, the next item is item 13, which is the letter of direction um, and our report back on that. And then more recently, uh, recently received um, a mandate letter uh, from the minister, uh, along with other agencies receiving their uh, letters. Do you want, Robert, I think you... you yeah, I'm up again. I think, I think you're up again. <laughs> um, so uh, my comment, I'm just going to provide a few comments to begin with. Uh, I personally like clarity of communications. I think we all do well and we have clarity of communications and I take both of these processes together to be a clarity of communications between ourselves and our shareholders. So it's always beneficial when when you sit down and, and you and you figure out exactly where uh, both stand and, and then put it down in paper and, and, and then proceed forward. So I think both exercises are to benefit to this corporation. Because Clarity and transparency. And transparency. And transparency. It's, a, it's the two. Right, because that's what the, these two documents do. Uh, I think in terms of the letter of direction, uh, again, there, you know, we work with the, the ministry every day, but we work with the ministry in so many different places, and, and the crossovers are, are so complex that I think there was 
an opportunity for uh, for a new communication strategy between ourselves and between each other of ourselves, either on the Metrolink side or the or the ministry side. And, and again, one of the focuses of that letter of direction was to set up a new com uh, communications protocol that was going to be used by, by both the shareholder and ourselves in terms of going forward. I think some of the other areas, uh, we have been working, for example, on on uh, KPIs that uh, that deal not with just financial KPIs, but but how we measure performance against our objectives as a corporation, and we've been working on that for a couple years now. I think the letter of direction gave us a sense of urgency to get that work done and get the ministry to agree to the same uh, KPIs as is what we wanted to use uh, to measure our success here as a corporation. So I think, again, you know the. The urging of, of the letter of direction gave us a chance to, to get to a point where yesterday we sent off our first report to the, the ministry on the KPIs that we'll use going forward. So I think in terms of the other aspects of the letter of direction, I think, again, there there's uh, we're now in a better position to move forward, understanding where we should be on on, on uh, sponsorships and, and where we should be in terms of accounting for things like overhead. So I found that exercise very beneficial and my colleagues uh, in the ministry, I would say, I would say, would say the same thing uh, as what I'm saying to the the board that that, that uh, letter of direction was very helpful. I think the one thing I will say with the mandate letter is it's an annual basis. So again, it's not looking out uh, ten, uh, ten years or two years. It's uh, it's direction to this corporation for the fiscal year ending uh, in in 18, it's 17, 18. So I think again, it's, you know, it was very specific. The other thing that I personally uh, always feel strongly about is, is, is what we do and what we build is one aspect of our business, but it's how we do it that sometimes counts as much as what we do. And I think, again, the mandate letter gives us uh, an idea of how they want us to proceed forward with the work that they've entrusted us to do. And I think that's consistent with our three values that we set up as a corporation of strive for excellence, think forward and play as a team. So again, I, I think the letter was not just, the mandate letter was not just important in terms of saying these are the things that you must complete during fiscal 17, 18, but it also gave us direction in terms of uh, working with the communities on how they want us to do that. So I think that was very important. And, and I think the final thing is, is just what is our promise to work and implement this mandate letter? And, and I think uh, there's two aspects to that. We will work very closely with the Ministry of Transportation and the staff in the planning and the financial and the other areas of the ministry to make sure that we deliver on this letter. And we will also incorporate our response to this letter in our in our 1718 uh, business plan and we will be held accountable to that response in our annual report for the fiscal year ended 1718 so again i think that these are two documents that make our lives easier frankly because they give us a good sense of direction from our shareholder although i'll confess the mandate letter is daunting isn't it in terms of the yeah responsibilities compared to where we were six or seven years ago, the continuing expansion of the number of things to get yeah. done is uh, it's quite extraordinary. Are there questions to Robert on either the public release of the letter of direction? We'd, we'd seen a letter of direction in our response and approved it as a board, as you know, back in the uh, end of September. Um, and are there any questions on the mandate letter that anybody has? I don't think there are any surprises in it. It's, it's all our priorities as previously stated, but rolled together into a single document um, um, and it, uh, it sets the bar pretty damn high. Does anybody have any question? Brian, is this an innovation in government from when you were a deputy minister? Oh, from when I was there, that's the, the dark ages, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think the sophistication of, uh, of, of, the, of the project management oversight parallels the scale. I mean, these are huge dollars we're talking, so we need very robust and sophisticated systems, and I think they are uh, matching the needs. Thank you. Um, Bonnie, you had a question or a comment. So I had a comment and a question to you, Mr. Chair. So my, my comment is anything that we get that helps us be more effective and more efficient is, is a good thing. And so it's, it's awfully hard to say anything that's wrong with this whole process. But I, I'm, I'm left comparing two things from our earlier conversations uh, at the board. 
and I remember reading the stakeholder audit of perceptions about uh, Metrolinx, and two of the perceptions that stuck in my mind were um, uh, a pe kind of a general pessimism uh, about our ability and authority to make decisions, to share information fully, uh, to clarify how decisions are made. And so from your perspective, when you read what is a first in terms of the comprehensiveness of this mandate uh, letter and, and the earlier direction, does this help us get at those stakeholder audit criticisms and the pessimism around us that we're not quite far enough away from the control of government to have people believe and trust what we do. Trying to reconcile those two pieces. I'm interested in your thoughts. I, I don't know. I, you know, we were was given advice that I'd be receiving a draft of the letter and would welcome my comments on it. So I set aside, you know, a day and a half of a weekend to prepare it. And I read the letter and I think I sent three, three sentences of comment, which would be thank you, good with it all, exactly what we have recommended to you. So, so it felt it felt totally partner-like uh, between a shareholder and uh, and the organization, and I felt completely comfortable with it, and found it clarifying and strong and a tremendously scary amount of work to get done, and it makes us publicly accountable for all of that. So it raises the bar for the board and the organization to live up to it. Um, but to go back, this is all this all comes out of the big move of the regional transportation plan, of all the things we're trying to do, the repeated announcements of support for us, and then rolling it together into a single place, I actually find extremely helpful and clarifying and positive in the relationship we have with the province. So I, I'm, I, I find it congenial and helpful. Um, I think our challenge is to deliver on, uh, on, on, on this, and I'm, I'm good with it. I like the fact it's public. I like the fact it's on our web page. I like the fact it's clear, it's clear uh, what we're being expected to do, and we can measure ourselves against our ability to deliver it. So I'm I'm very I'm, I'm very I'm very comfortable. Maybe others might have a different view, and I'm open to different views. Don't uh, you ask me my personal view? But my personal view, I say, having set aside a day and a half to edit like mad, and finding I only needed 15 minutes to read it and write a relatively short email. I, that to me was the test of worrying about knowing I was going to see a draft and in fact finding it totally supportive of the organization and aligned with all the priorities we have set in our in our annual object plan, you know, in our business plan and our annual objective setting and our five year plan lines up like with this really close. So maybe in fact that transparency of this nature might help us with that external pessimism about about us and, and our our ability to actually make the decisions. Yeah, and as you know, I'm not pessimistic about us, so it's yeah, a, yeah. I, I'm coming from a different yeah. place. Yeah. Thank you. Does anybody else have any questions or comments on this? I'd just like to thank Jen Gray and her team for the work they did on the letter of direction. That was a lot of hard work and on the KPIs that they've been doing for the last two or three years. Great. Thank you very much. Good job. We don't have to approve anything here, right? It's nope. It's done deal. Marianne, I think that brings us to item 14. You let us know how our customers are experiencing us, because this, of course, is at the heart of what we do. Despite all the talk of all this other stuff, it's about it's about serving our customers. So Over have, you. Thank you. Uh, I have four items to report on. The first is the customer experience advisory committee. Uh, update, uh, Carl Zayer chairs that committee, which I think is a really important um, regular checkup with, check-in with customers who uh, the committee, Carl reported the committee continues to change, change individuals, but some people have been very long-standing, and it's a very uh, cooperative discussion around issues that are happening and uh, getting direct feedback from our customers. So um, there, uh, there was a report they're reporting that there were added automated audio and visual train announcements uh, that provide a more consistent experience across the GO network and comply with the AODA, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disability. And I just say that that act continues to um, be more and more demanding. So I think we're, you know, we're implementing it physical, in physical ways as well as in um, information, the way information is distributed. Uh, Triplinks, which is the uh, program which advises on on 
uh, schedules and linking of travel. I think it's a very important app for people who are coming from here to there, making multiple transfers, and it gives that real-time information, vehicle progress tracker, and customized schedule. And this, again, uh, MetroLinx continues to invest in this, and I think a very important uh, part of seamless travel in the province. Uh, the second item was the uh, update on operations. Um, there's a kiosk pilot which has which provides uh, additional self-service options to ghost customers at stations. The kiosk assists customers with scheduling, trip planning, service updates, and construction notices. And I assume for people who are not traveling with their own cell phone, this is something that's very handy when you hit the station or you're departing. Um, so that pilot kicked off in November and. Uh, Metrolinx is collecting the feedback during the pilot, and, and this will inform the, the kiosk rollout across the system. Uh, more than uh, the, the update on Up Express, uh, more than 791,000 riders used the Up Express in the past quarter, and this is an increase of 28% to the previous quarter. Uh, at the end of June 2016, the average daily ridership uh, was approximately 7,600, 7, and it grew by 20%. Uh, over the at the end of September to 9,100 riders. So the priority, the, the the it's primarily an airport service with 77 percentage of the trips occurring between Toronto Pearson and Union Station, and the remaining 23 percent of trips are daily commuters or occasional riders. So I think we can see sort of broad and steady adoption of the Up Express based on the changes I think that we've made. The responsive changes on pricing are clearly a factor. As well as sort of the opportunity to have uh, you know, have the system settle into people's imagining and understanding. Uh, the third is uh, third item is the Presto update. I think as Rob Hollis has reported, uh, we're almost complete on the rollout of Fairgate. Uh, looking forward to the full 69 stations being complete by the end of the year. Uh, the rollout across 1,900 TTC buses is close to completion. Uh, over 250 streetcars, uh, including legacy and new streetcars, are Presto enabled. And uh, in November, Presto began the deployment of all TTC wheel trans and accessible taxi vehicles. The fourth update is uh, design excellence. Uh, there we were the report came to us uh, on wayfinding and harmonization project was uh, which is underway and offers customers a simplified and standardized viewing of wayfinding products at connections between transit agencies so i think this is really again part of that end game uh, that is fair integration is being able to very quickly understand where you are through the wayfinding harmonization and make your way through a system uh, integrated transit maps are being developed and include multiple forms of transit such as subways, LRTs, BRTs, and GO trains. And particularly, again, important as you can use your Presto to access these systems and roll through them. Uh, there's a pilot proje project with the new standards for signage uh, which will happen at Hamilton GO Center, Pickering GO Station, and Finch St Station in the spring of 2017. That is the end of the report. Thank you for your leadership of that committee. And Carl, thank you uh, in particular as a member of that committee for your leadership of the uh, advisory council because it really makes it the inputs. It's very real, right? It's very authentic. Really good advice. Uh, it, it is. And I really do appreciate the advisory committee members uh, coming forward. I just want to underline one point that uh, Mary had talked about. And it's actually on page 249, I think it is, of our diligent book. And it relates to the Accessibilities uh, Act in uh, AODA. And this comes up at every meeting that we have in terms of uh, making sure that we are conscious of the variety of disabilities that exist, whether they be a, mi a fairly minor one to a very severe disability. And it's not only just on, on the transit, whether it's a bus or a train, it's in the stations, it's in uh, how we present things on our websites and the accessibility in terms of uh, Presto probably, y you name it, it's through the entire organization. And just to keep that foremost, because with our aging society, uh, this is uh, without a doubt going to be of a, of a greater 
or affect more people. <clears throat> and therefore, we have to be very conscious of it. I know we are, but I think it's just something that we have to always be thinking about uh, in the, the broader context. Thank you. Any questions to uh, Marianne? Everybody happy? Excellent. Next is we have um, the appointment of a couple of officers. Is George Bell present? George, why don't you just stand up? Um, George Bell is proposed to be appointed Vice President Safety and Security. Give, you've got a great background. Give us, give, give, just come up to the table for, for a minute and give, give us two minutes on your background. And Jerry, are you here? Is Jerry here too? Jerry Chapman? Okay, we won't do it the same with Jerry. George, as you know, safety is our number one concern for our passengers. Um, can you just give the board a couple of minutes on your background before they appoint you as an officer? Thank you. Um, I bring about uh, close to 30 years of experience in the rail industry, uh, starting with uh, heavy rail. Um, worked in um, uh, the rail maintenance programs as I, when I began. Soon got into safety. Uh, there, uh, stayed with CN for a number of years, finally moved over to West Coast Express, which is uh, rather a miniature Go Transit. Uh, stayed there, uh, later became uh, Director of uh, Safety, Security and Support Services at a company called BCRTC, which runs both uh, SkyTrain and West Coast Express uh, in Vancouver. Uh, worked there for uh, a good part of my career. Um, also supported the TransLink organization in terms of safety and security development, um, and uh, left to do some consulting. Uh, had the, what is absolutely a capstone opportunity for a long career in railway and railway safety, public safety, with the opportunity to come here and uh, serve this great organization. Terrific that you signed up. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you. How long will it be before you're in a position to come to whether it's customer experience or to audit or to both, because both have responsibility to give us your top line assessment of how we're doing. We, we hear from Greg always about how we're doing, but with your expertise and with your breadth of experience, when, when, when do you think you'd be in a position to give us your take, the good, the bad, and everything in between? At our, at our next meeting, so uh, I think it's the February meeting. Wow. If, yes. I'll be an interest. Be an inter a, first, a first view. There will be more depth to be gained. But first year. And then we should hear about it at the board level, coming through the committees as to how we're doing. Um, welcome, welcome aboard, Marianne. Do you want to move approval of George's appointment? And Brian, do you want to second it since your committees are primarily responsible? <laughs> Any dissent? Congratulations, George. Welcome Thank aboard. You. And then Jerry Chaput is not here. Um, he's coming to be the Vice President Rapid Transit Capital Projects Group. John, do you want to say a word about Jerry? Bruce had to step out for a minute to deal with something. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, we're very fortunate to have Jerry Chaput uh, joining us from the uh, province of Ontario MTO. He was formerly uh, Assistant Deputy Minister uh, of the Highways Division for MTO. He comes with a depth and breadth of experience that's, that's very appropriate for his role as Vice President of Rapid Transit. He'll be assuming responsibility for all of the light rail truck projects, uh, uh, and bus rapid transit, uh, I guess my old role, and I'm very happy to have him here now <laughs> because I've been wearing two hats for quite a while and it's, uh, it's a great uh, pleasure and relief to have Jerry here. Jerry's been here for, um, for uh, uh, a month or two, and, um, or a month or so, and he's just naturally stepped into the role as if he was in it uh, all along, so he brings uh, great experience and particularly you know on the construction side of the business but also on the government side of the business so he understands all sides of the equation and the uh, and the responsibilities and sensitivities that go along with that so happy to have him here excellent um marianne will you move this one too yeah, can i have a little more detail on what that role is uh, uh, interesting i didn't realize you, you you'd been doing both roles in a sense can you sort of distinguish with what you do with what well, john came okay. to metrolinx to do this to do this yeah. Job previously, when Jack was the chief cap right. officer, and Jack, yeah, Jack this, retired. This so I, I came here originally from Ottawa. I was heading up the Confederation line in Ottawa, right. and I came here to be vice you president. Of, yes, it was him. I was asking. Yeah. About, yeah, yeah, and so he's he's moved into my old role as vice president of Rapid Transit. So he's take he's responsible for all of the light rail projects. So across town. Uh, Finch, uh, Hamilton, here Ontario, 
And then the bus rapid transit program, so Mississauga Transit Way, all of those pieces that go along with that. The rapid transit, of course, is one half of Capital Projects Group. The other side of Capital Projects Group is Regional Express Rail, and I oversee the whole thing. Great. Thank you. Makes sense? Yes. Got it. So you not, you'll now move it? I'll sign, I'll sign it. Okay. Yes. You'll second it, Rose? Any dissent? There is none. That's great. And we had the resignation, as you know, that we discussed previously of James Perkins as the EVP uh, previously um, when we did the reorganization of the, uh, of, of the structure under John. Um, that brings us to the uh, reports of the various um, uh, from management. I think with the exception of Greg, we've already had a lot of airtime with everybody and we probably don't need a lot, but let me just see if there are any questions. Any qu further questions to Robert Hollis on his report? I see none, Robert. Um, just deliver on everything you said you do. That's great. Greg, why don't you come up to the table while you're getting settled. I'll just see, did anybody have any questions to Leslie about planning and policy beyond the matters we already covered? I think we're in good shape there. And communications and public affairs, Judy, you've been busy. Uh, lots going on. Um, but do you have anything we, we need to pursue with you today? Um, and John, you've given us a very thorough report on your work already today, so I feel we're well covered on capital projects. So, Greg, uh, we have your report. Nice numbers. Numbers are getting strong again. Um, uh, very couple of bumps. Um, anything you want to draw our attention to or anything you need to tell us? You've got, you do run the organization. <laughs> the, re the rest of what we do is in support of Greg Percy, so how, how are we serving? Perhaps not quite like that, yeah. <laughs> the, uh, well, this, as, as you've heard all day, lots and lots going on. Um, up and, and go, they're the front line, they deal with the customer, they translate all the good stuff that we're doing into day-to-day -day service. And, uh, and I think that level of service is, is back to where it should be. Um, this reporting period uh, is quite uh, transitional from probably the dark days of, of July and, and early August when we did the, the mammoth schedule changes to support freeing up two tracks at Union Station. And, and uh, you know, we, we managed to get through that with, with sort of but substandard performances for on-time performance uh, of 90 and 91%. But I'm really happy to report that September's 95, October's 96, uh, and we needed to build that customer goodwill going into the winter. Uh, also happy to report we've, uh, uh, the odd expression, we've just gotten through another leaf season where, uh, where uh, the trees uh, emptied out onto the tracks. And, uh, and Rob, you may remember back to 2009 where we lost one full rush hour because of those crinkly things. and. That has yet to be seen again, so uh, very pleased with the team effort on that. Uh, and that's a nice feed into the winter, which uh, contractually it really started November 15th with all the standby contracts for snow clearance. So we're ready. We've done our full winter preparedness uh, coming in. Uh, so we think we're quite ready. And then Peters from are the... Peters are all ready to go on the... All that stuff is, is good to go. Which is... uh, and then whatever happens, we manage on the fly, which is what we've traditionally done and, and quite well. Um, there's, uh, that's kind of the day job. The other part of what we do is how to make things better. And uh, I like, like to report up uh, on one of the key things I'm really proud of my team for doing, which is uh, second to labor, fuel is the biggest cost item. Uh, and we've done some really excellent work on, on one on two front that's done, on, and then second front is what's about to do. Uh, so we uh, put through for both trains and buses an idle control program. Uh, the outcome of that, and it's, it, I'm going to oversimplify it, but it was not simple, uh, was to do a cost avoidance of basically 5% of our fuel budget, which is about $1.2 million recurring per year. Uh, we're following that up with something called throttle control, which is using, uh, you know, uh, basically a computer will talk to the operator and tell them when they're off the acceleration, deceleration curve. <coughs> Sounds fairly complicated. Actually, it's not so much, but... Uh, that size of the price is at least, again, 1.2 million per year and 5% on the fuel budget. Those are huge recurring wins, uh, and, and that enables us to do a whole lot of other things. So uh, I think that also demonstrates... That's be environmentally good, too. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and so, so they're all good things that the team are working behind the scenes to do. Um, but it's other than that, our, our customer satisfaction has back to where uh, it should be. Uh, and in the, in the 80 sort of 84% range, um, that was the spring reporting. The next reporting will reflect the July and August period. We're expecting a little dip. 
Uh, but I fully expect to say, get back again to where we belong. The so. integration of Up Express as just a part of Go, if you will. Um, I know it's still branded, but yeah. in terms of operations, you've taken over responsibility for the whole thing. Yeah. Has that gone well? It's gone really well. And in, in fact, uh, you know, where we started was uh, a metric success was the integration between the two services on, on the Western subdivision, which basically goes from the airport to the perimeter of Union Station. Uh, and we had on one hand the number of interactions that were uh, counterproductive to either service, uh, and that's exceptional given the sheer scale of uh, train starts that both involve. So uh, that was, uh, I mean, we look back and uh, when we, we brought up in in June of, of uh, 15, we jumped our monthly service from 7,000 to 11,000 trip, train trips a month. That is, that was an awesome step up in terms of activity level and to make that work as well as as the team did you know hats off to them so so so, so far so good we have some other ways we think we can bring them together uh drive some cost out keep the productivity up so so they're certainly in play um so and and my team talks operations not go up at this point it's just service levels how do you get them better up car um greg so any uh, two questions the first one on the customer charter, passenger charter, I should say, anything driving the high level of complaints related to comfort? Um, what's causing that? And then Absolutely, I yeah. The uh, comfort in that, the, the, the descriptor behind that metric is actually empty seats. Uh, that's the biggest driver to comfort. Uh, and the fact that our ridership is growing, uh, even when actually we've exceeded budget, we were quite concerned earlier in the fiscal that we may not even hit the budget level of ridership increase. We've surpassed that. Uh, in fact, we're probably the only transit agency in North America that's growing its ridership as we speak. Most either held the line or shrunk. So, so as your ridership grows and your train starts and your uh, number of coaches per train don't keep pace, um, then then you have less articulate, you have uh, more people standing uh, and the, the bums in the seats are all full. So, so we, 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 we can't move on that. Uh, so, so when that happens, technically the comfort level goes down. Uh, we actually have challenged whether or not that's the right metric anyway, because the other part of that metric is we're growing uh, and that's a good thing. And then the second sort of unrelated to that is, tell me a little bit about the community initiative related to mental health that you and Go Transit was a part of. Is I thought that was quite quite good in terms of community benefit as well. Well, it, I, I, it's something I'm pretty personally quite proud of, and I think we start to roll out uh, in the industry, uh, where uh, the former Minister of Transportation, Lisa Rate, federal, uh, pulled together industry representatives, uh, including me, and probably about a year and a half ago now, uh, and she brought in a freelance writer from Burlington whose son uh, had tragically jumped in front of a GO train about 10 years prior. Uh, and uh, Lisa Rates' appeal to the group was, can't we do better? Can't we do something? Um, and frankly, on the drive back to the office, I said, we can, uh, and let's do something relatively simple. So I pulled the, a small team together, and basically we, we, uh, we partnered with a, a company called Connects Ontario, which is an agency of the province also. I needed a company that had a 1-800 number, 24-7, 365. They had that. Um, and what we basically did was we put up a sign on every level of crossing we own, every bridge we own, every station, saying, you know, in trouble, need to talk to someone, call this number. Uh, and within three months, we did this for May, I believe it was May 15, we started. By July, um, we had been contacted saying that we had saved someone's life, which is a very quick ROI on, on a very small investment. Uh, so, so I sit on a number of boards, and I've now got VIA and CN uh, both on side with the concept. So we're going to go national with this program. Um, can't use the same 1-800 number, but it'll have to vary by area. But um, I think the industry has picked up saying this is a very non-traditional partnership, but one that makes sense and can save lives. I have Carl, then Brian. Thank you. I had the same question that uh, Upcar did about the comfort. Thanks. Brian? And, and as did I, I just, I just wanted to elaborate on it a little bit more. Uh, this week, uh, I heard on a radio show uh, representatives from TTC talking about maybe um, other mechanical ways to inhibit people from getting onto tracks. Uh, 
Have we ever considered anything of that nature? Um, one of the natures of railways is, is, is the porosity of the, the railway corridor. There's so many yeah. different ways to get on the track. Uh, what we do uh, is where we have high trespass zones, um, we will put up a high density security fence, uh, which doesn't always solve it, but it maybe moves it away. Um, the, but the, this, the, the thing that Upcar was asking about, it's not, that's not the same thing. 75% of the fatalities we see are, are unfortunately suicides and 25% trespassing. Uh, you know, people racing across the track and trying to be faster than trains, which doesn't work. So, right. um, so they're two very different things. It's very, very difficult to shield uh, our right of way from someone who is desperate. Very, very difficult to do. Thank you. Um, Real quick. Oh, yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm, uh, gonna, you, I'm, I'm still going to get a prize. We're 45 minutes ahead. So I'm going to take advantage of that. Take advantage of uh, that. You said something interesting about the ridership piece, and I understand ours is increasing, which is great, but the other side of it, you said that most in North America are either flat or decreasing. That's right. Can you give a little bit of context to that on the decrease side? Uh, yeah, I think part of it, because uh, because they are all sort of being internally reflective, saying well, what's going on, and a big part of it is I think that the price of gas is so low uh, throughout North America. Uh, people who actually who were using transit have gone back to using their cars. Um, I think I think that's the major driver, uh, and for us. Uh, and for some other agencies, it's about how do you get more frequency and convenience out there. That's really the draw to most people who use transit, who, who want to make the move. They're on the bubble kind of thing from driving their own cars and using transit. So if, if we can get more frequency and more convenience, then they're going to make the move and give it a try. Once they try, then our challenge is how do you sustain them in the system, and that's about reliability. And in those uh, regions or jurisdictions where they're flatlined or declining, have they also flatlined their investment in transit infrastructure as a result of that? Well, they're, they're two different models. I think we're, we're very, very fortunate in Ontario to have the, the level of trust the province has put in us to invest in our infrastructure. Uh, in the United States, the, uh, it's actually the federal government through the uh, um, FRA, the Federal Railway Administration, that administers the largest injection of capital into transit. Um, and for their own reasons, which I won't try to defend, uh, they're extremely complicated to extract the money from. So they have the ability to renounce the same money, um, which is their thing. But it's big money that they put in. They put in about $12 billion a year into transit. But I, I would suspect a portion of that is renounced every year. Um, so they do have alternate financing mechanisms down there. They can do bonding. They do state, state funding and other things. In fact, one of the larger ones actually took a percentage of online casino revenues to, to fund transit, which is a little unusual. Um, so different model to what we have. But uh, yet, no, they're still building. Uh, they have the same challenges as us in the United States in terms of uh, needing the operating dollars to support the infrastructure built. Uh, and in some cases, they're not actually uh, properly utilizing the infrastructure they have built. Greg, thank you very much. You're doing a heck of a job. Please thank all your colleagues. I've been riding with them a fair bit recently, talking to the engineers. They're all happy. To a person that I've spoken with. Um, Bruce, I think we have a guest you were going to introduce. Yes, I wanted to introduce uh, Rosemary Powell. Come on uh, up, Rosemary. Oh, come on up. <laughs> or come on down, as they said, and the price is right. <laughs> <laughs> and our price is always right. Yeah. And uh, well, Rosemary makes her way up to the table. I just wanted to acknowledge her. Rosemary is leader at the oh, Toronto. Right here, right. Rosemary, you can sit beside Howard. Uh, leader at the Toronto Community Benefits Network. Okay. and uh, is one of our key partners with the Community Benefits Agreement and was a, a key speaker at the event yesterday where the uh, announcement was made, very articulate and uh, a wonderful partner. And uh, I just wanted to thank Rosemary for her partnership and uh, acknowledge that we have a lot of work still to do. This is kind of the, uh, the, uh, the, the end of the beginning and some of the really hard work now that we have the uh, agreement in place is to execute and implement against the agreement but with partners that uh, like the uh, Toronto Community Benefits Network. I'm confident that we'll get there. So I just wanted to thank you. Thank you very much. Rosemary, thank you for coming. Bruce said you're extremely articulate yesterday, so <laughs> take advantage of that and say a few words. <laughs> um, no, yesterday I really just wanted to recognize the significance um, of the milestone that we reached together um, and, you know, just the leadership that Metrolinx has shown uh, in our community 
around uh, community benefits, bringing all the different partners and stakeholders to the table, and you know, just working with us through thick and thin to actually make this happen. And we know that it's gonna take, you know, the work is, you know, there's been a lot of work, but the real work now <laughs> is, uh, is just beginning. And we look forward to that and to see the promise of community benefits realized. You know, obviously, you know, the Crosstown is significant. It's a great model that we believe that we can use for other projects going forward, like the Finch LRT. That's my community where I'm from, and so um, I'm looking forward to that and, and others. So thank you very much for your wonderful warm welcome. <laughs> great, great of you to come. Thank, thank you for you. being with us. Don't move because we're almost done. Okay. You don't need to walk around anymore. Is there any, let me just check if there's anything at the end here I was meant to do. That, no. Is there any other business any member of the board wishes to bring before the meeting? Does management have any other matters you wish to bring before the meeting? No. In the absence of that, let me wish all of you, we do have to go back into session and close session to approve some commercial contracts on, uh, very, on various items. So we'll take a break for, let's say, 15 minutes, and then we'll come back and uh, but we'll be finished. But we'll be finished by 3:30, if you're building your schedule. Um, and to everybody who's here today, not just the board, but everybody, may you have a very happy holiday season. And we look forward to seeing you in the new year. Thank you very much for being here. We're done.